or the tan memo. Everything black. Oh, Justin's bridging both worlds. And it's just scary. Like sort of Never changed it because it just rolls over and you've never voted against it. And so I think what we should do is clean it up this year. So it, it, it is a good English teacher ever. Like it's, you know. Oh, Lori. Okay. Yeah. Really Something you got something I did. This regular meeting of the Independent School District 535 School Board is called to order at 5.31 p.m. on Tuesday, April 9, 2024, in room 137 of the Edison Building. The board acknowledges this site and all RPS sites are situated on the ancestral land of the Dakota people, and we honor the Dakota nations and the sacred land of all indigenous peoples. This meeting is being live streamed and interested members of the public are welcome and encouraged to view this meeting remotely at youtube.com backslash ISD 535. Tonight's meeting is also being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel following completion of the meeting. The agenda and documents for this meeting are available online at rochesterschools.org backslash assembly. Present at this meeting are school board members, Superintendent Kent Pakel, a non-voting ex officio member, and Assistant School Board Clerk, Ms. Lori Sam. Ms. Sam, would you please call the roll? Director Barlow. Here. Director Cook. Here. Director Garcia. Here. Director McLaughlin. Here. Director Martin. Here. Director Nathan. Here. Director Woodson. Here. At this time, we offer the opportunity to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item 2.1 is approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? Move approval. Second. It has been moved and seconded to approve the agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The agenda has been approved. Um, a note to the board and the community assembled. If we're still meeting around 7 o'clock, we'll decide whether or not we should take a 10-minute recess at that time or at some time later during the meeting. Comments to the board. It is important for the school board to hear from our stakeholders regarding issues that impact our students, staff, families, and schools. We welcome communication via email, phone call, at our community engagement listening sessions and here during comments to the board. Persons who want to make comments to the board must fill out the online request to provide comments to the board form by 5 p.m. on the Monday before the school board meeting to sign up for a time slot. The form is available on the RPS website, rochesterschools.org, under school board communications, and on the Simbly main page at rochesterschools.org backslash Simbly. The purpose of comments to the board is to give community members an opportunity to provide input directly to the school board about issues that fall within our authority. The board and superintendent do not respond directly to the speaker's comments during the meeting, but may follow up with the speaker if requested and appropriate. A reminder that policy 206 and procedure 206A set the time, place, and manner procedures and restrictions on comments to the board. These ensure privacy protections for students and staff and prohibit comments that are threatening, profane, lewd, vulgar, obscene, harassing, abusive, or constitute a personal attack on others. Speakers, when your name is called, please come to the table. Choose a microphone to speak into and be seated. 
you will have three minutes to speak and the timer will be displayed right in front of me. Please begin your remarks by stating your name. If you have written materials to the board, please provide them to the assistant school board clerk prior to your remarks and she will distribute them to school board members. Speaker one this evening is Karen Sharon.
Our next agenda item is 4.1, Information and Outreach, Student Activities and Athletics Recognition. Superintendent Pickell. Thank you, Chair Nathan. This is one of the favorite times for many of us when we get to recognize our athletes, our artists, our scientists. We've got, I know, some in the hallway here. I want to just invite folks, if you are not planning to stay, this is a good time to transition so we can make space for students. Um, but if you are, we welcome you uh, to stay. We are going to try and make sure we have a somewhat clearer process this year than we've had in the past. And that process is going to be pretty common sense, but one that we haven't always made really clear. I'm going to turn it over in a moment to our chief of schools, Jackie Peterson. And Jackie is going to ask a number of people to bring up coaches and advisors who will recognize students. Now, students, if you are here, when your coach or your advisor is talking about you, face this way. Because these folks, they're, they're the school board. They're my bosses. They're very important. They want to see you. They want to see your faces. And so while your coach is talking, please turn to face this way. When your coach or your advisor is done talking, we want you to turn around, and Ms. Sam is going to head out right there in the middle of the room, and we're going to get a picture of you. And after we take that picture, that's when we want to clap for all of the teams, folks. So we want to get this a bit more coordinated. Um, so to sum up, while you are uh, being talked about, if you are a student here, please face the board. Uh, they want to see your face. And then right after we finish that, and we want coaches and advisors to be a part of this too, please turn, face the audience. Ms. Sam will take a picture, and then we'll recognize you with some applause. Before we get into all of that, one thing we want to do, whatever you're here for, whether it's a program, a sport, the arts, we want to recognize the parents and caregivers who are here because this can't happen without all of you. You get kids to practices, to rehearsals, um, and you encourage them in many ways uh, to take that risk and get out there on the field or up on the stage. So I would like to ask the board to join me in thanking all of our parents and caregivers now. And then we are going to make the rest of this presentation just about the kids. And so I'm going to um, uh, turn it back to our chair, who's going to uh, kick us off before Ms. Peterson uh, takes over. So I'm going to ask Deb Last to come up to introduce mm -hmm. Samuel Casper, our national champion in the National STEM Challenge. Hey, good evening, everybody. I am Deb Last. I am a eighth grade science teacher. Oh, no, uh, I'm sorry, Deb. We, see, Samuel, you're a genius, but I just gave all these directions. No, <laughs> come out here in the front. Come on. We're all going to be working for you in five years. Yeah. So, OK, now, there you stand right Perfect. there. Sorry, Deb. Um, so now we're going to, we're, we're gonna, Ms. Lass is going to give that intro. And then when we're done, you're going to turn and we're going to take a picture of your class. But you're right there. You're doing everything you need to do right now. Please. <laughs> So as I said, I'm an eighth grade science teacher at John Adams Middle School. I'm here to introduce Samuel Kaspar, and I got to meet him as a seventh grader when his teacher said, I have an advanced learner who's very advanced. What can we do? <laughs> um, so I've, I've had the pleasure of being his science teacher this year, and to kind of let you know, this is a student that's very self-motivated, a hard worker, and he really ponders and thinks about things in a deep manner. When I said, Samuel, you've had some experience as a seventh grader. How about writing an APA this year? He looks at me, and most of us that have been to grad school go, what? And he goes, oh, OK. <laughs> so um, one of the opportunities we put in front of Samuel this year to um, kind of give him a challenge was called the National STEM Challenge. And um, we are proud to announce that Samuel has been announced as one of the champions of the nation. And he is being flown out to Washington, D.C. in a couple of days here. He will be presenting to lawmakers and leaders across our nation at the STEM Festival that is taking place in Washington, D.C. So Samuel, we are so proud of you. Now you can turn around and we're going to clap. <laughs> I'd like
like to call up Mark Queasley, Century High School Activities Director, to introduce, um, I think, Rochester Raiders to begin with, and then he'll um, talk about the Century uh, students. I'm not sure if, it's got a mind of its own tonight. I'm not sure if Coach Coppler is here or any of our adapted, oh, there there you are, walked right by you. Jeff Coppler, our Rochester Raiders floor hockey coach, is going to come up and just say a few words about our Raiders uh, for the winter season. Jeff? Yeah, come on up. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, just want to quick introduce Andrew Westerman. He was the captain of our Raider floor hockey team that finished fourth place at this year's uh, state tournament in March. Um, Andrew was the all-conference, all-state, and the post-bulletin player of the year for adapted hockey. Um, also, Andrew is a great leader. He's also the captain of the softball and the soccer teams that compete in the fall and the spring. And thankfully, Andrew was able to be excused from softball practice so he could be here tonight. <laughs> um, just a quick note for the adapted athletics program in general, for the school board that may not be aware, this adapted athletics program that the Raiders participate in through the Minnesota State High School League is the only one of its kind in the nation. And the Rochester Raiders floor hockey team just competed, completed our 31st year of competition. Uh, since that time, we've uh, added the, both the soccer and the softball team, so now we compete in all three sports, softball, hockey, and soccer. So this is quite an opportunity for these athletes. They get to participate in state tournaments. They can letter. They do everything any other athlete is able to achieve, all the while being recognized as uh, one of their peers throughout the schools. So it's really very great opportunity for these players to have this opportunity for this adapted athletics program. And Andrew is a great example of uh, what being a Rochester Raider is all about. And you did hear that correctly. Andrew is a three-sport athlete in adapted athletics, which is unbelievable. And Andrew, you do a great job of representing Rochester Public Schools. Um, as um, hot off the press as this weekend, our robotics team um, had some wonderful news. And I'm going to have the robotics coaches come up next here. Um, but as they're coming up, I do want to acknowledge two of our winner coaches that were Minnesota State High School Coaches Association Co-head coaches of the year, Josh Klingfus and Matt Erridge from our hockey team, our co-op hockey team with Century, John Marshall. So we'd like to say congratulations to them. Next, robotics. Good evening. I'm Tim Alexander. I have the privilege of being one of the coaches for the high school robotics team that's uh, representing all three of the Rochester Public Schools. Uh, I couldn't get any of the students to leave the shop tonight. They're all elbow deep in robot right now, trying to get ready for our world competition, but I did want to come and give you a quick update. Uh, we finished our competition season 24, five and oh. Uh, we're ranked number nine in the state after uh, two regional events. So what that does for us is it also gets us to the state competition in Minnesota, robotics is considered a varsity sport, just like football, basketball, et cetera. And so there is a state competition where the top 36 teams compete. So once we get back from Worlds, we'll fix whatever damage we have and, and then prepare for that. That's on uh, May the 4th, Star Wars Day. And uh, so then hopefully after that, we can come in and give you a final report and get some students to show up. But thank you for having us. Mr. Queasley, before you go on, I think I'd like to send the robotics team off with their customary cheer. The team number is 2530. So the customary cheer is 5, 10, 15, 20. 2530! Well done. <laughs> Thank you. 
And Madam Chair, can I ask Mr. Carlson for um, more credit limit on the department <laughs> credit card? Because um, <laughs> this trip is going to be about $30,000 for them. And to come up with that in about a week and a half is going to be quite a task for this group. So they're diligently working on that as we speak. And as they said, they do not want to be out of the shop tonight. Um, up next, I'm going to introduce our boys swim and dive. If our boys swim and dive guys would come up. Coach Freeman could not be here this evening. Um, she had a, another commitment, but I do want to introduce these outstanding young men. 14 weeks of practice, 3,336 yards of swimming, just down and back a couple of times. Um, uh, in front of you tonight, we have the 200 free relay, relay fifth place finishers, um, which was Eli Holmes, Owen Kelly, Nate Crom and Andrew Linden. Also in the 400 free relay, they took fifth place, and Grady Barkfried was an add-in in that group. And then Grady also took eighth place in the 100 breaststroke. Um, Brett Boyd is an All-American, and Felix Liu is also an All-American, and Joe Vesterby is an All-American based on their race times. And this team also was academic gold. So when they weren't swimming, they had their nose in books. Um, congratulations to the Century Boys Swim and Dive. <laughs> and is John Gamble here this evening? I don't know if I saw. We had one girl on the Century John Marshall uh, girls hockey team that was academic all state and that was Annika Torbenson and Annika I don't see her either next up Miss Shelley Filson with BPA good evening I'm Shelly Filson, and I'm the uh, business teacher at Century High School and the BPA advisor. And tonight, I, I got to read from my notes, guys, because I'm nervous and I want to get this right. I stand before you today with, with immense pride and joy to celebrate the remarkable achievements of the state BPA winners of Century High School. These students have exemplified excellence, dedication, and determination, showcasing the true spirit of academic pursuit and professional readiness. So allow me to introduce you to our outstanding individuals and some teams. I have Anna Milsevic, who secured first place in economic research individual category, and together with Rhea Shaw, they clinched second place in the economic research team. This is for the state. William Yan, whose proficiency in personal finance management earned him fourth place in the state. Mahadev Krishnan and Krishnal Kardival, both achieving fifth place in health administration concepts. Peter Schuler attended, um, he remained, excuse me, he achieved second place in fundamental accounting. Colin Chen, first place in medical coding. Angie Gasner, she's gone tonight, she had her wisdom teeth taken out. <laughs> Excellence in um, business law and ethics and fifth place in um, also showcasing in digital marketing concepts. Uh, Max Oftedal showcasing his skills and for took fourth place in Python programming. Danielle Wing, which um, she just stepped away, but Danielle, she achieved first place in advanced test stop publishing, second place in health administration concepts, fifth place in information technology, open concepts, and she also took um, as a finalist position in user experience design team with Dean Wing. And Ethan Zhang, he achieved a first place in advanced accounting. Uh, Armida Kazemi, we're in fourth place in fundamentals of web design, fifth place in financial math and analyst concepts. Um, and then our teams. Again, that was Anna Milsevic and Rhea Shaw, and then uh, Dean, Danielle Wang and Dean Wang. So these are some uh, outstanding students. I'm proud of the work you've done, and well done. Up next, Mr. Chuck Hanlon with chess. Hey, 
Uh, I'm Chuck Wheeler Handland, and this I just finished my 24th year of coaching the Century Chess Team. I coached the team as a faculty member at Century, and I've continued to coach since retirement. So I also the proud parent of two graduates of the Rochester Public Schools, one that recently finished training to be a federal law enforcement officer in Customs and Border Protection, the other is a lawyer. I'm so grateful they graduated before their mind got messed up by DEI. <laughs> um, anyway, this team represents both the JV and the varsity chess, chess team. Uh, the Century JV finished first in the Rochester Area Scholastic Chess League City Cup Tournament, and Josh Wang on your left here, who's an eighth grader and will be part of the varsity team, finished 10th overall at the state tournament. And uh, on his left, to your right, is Ethan Zhang, who is a senior. And I have worked with Ethan since sixth grade. You're gonna, Ethan's not leaving after this. Ethan's gonna be popping up and down, up and down, because he's involved with so many amazing activities and successes. Um, but Ethan was the team captain, and the varsity team won the regular season undefeated, won the city cup, and then they went on to state. I do wanna tell you that at the state tournament, you can bring as many players as you want. Uh, Eastview had 19, uh, Wyzetta had 26, but they only count the scores of your top four players. We had five, and they ended up in second place. And that didn't leave much wiggle room for somebody having a bad tournament. These guys were hyper-focused, and they're not the greatest players, but it's the greatest team I've ever had for them to finish at the highest position ever for centuries. So, a lot of success. Thank you. And last on my list for Kale Bryant, uh, our math league. If we have any math league members, we would like to have them quick come up, please. Once again, th thanks for the opportunity to recognize not all our athletes, but our academic and our activity fine arts students here this evening. This math league team took second in the state tournament uh, for Rochester Public Schools and Century High School. Um, Kyle couldn't be here this evening, but he wanted to make sure that we recognize this group of outstanding students. Um, Golden Pang, Amita, Kazmi, Albert Hugh, Eric Ding, and Artina, Kazmi, Elizabeth, Zhao, Felix, Lu, Arden, Peng, William Yen, Eric Hill, Dan Min, Daniel Menguel, um, Evelyn Kim, uh, Jaden, holy moly, is Jaden, uh, Jaden, are you standing here? No? Okay. <laughs> I'm not even going to try that one. I'll come back to that. Jerry Zhang. Mandy Yao, Nick Singer, and Shannon Kim. And I think it's Jay Chanarana uh, is the last name. I butchered it, and I'm going to apologize right now. The Rochester Century Math League team. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to call up Brian Erke, uh, Activities Director at John Marshall High School. Thank you for having us out tonight. Um, first group I'm going to call up, or first person I'm going to call up is Coach uh, Chad Ole of the JM Girls Basketball Team Head Coach and Kira Durr, Senior at John Marshall.
So those of you who don't know Kira, Kira is not only a basketball player, she is also our drumline captain at JM and captain for the girls basketball team and she is an academic All-State with a 3.96 GPA while being captain of two different groups. So I uh, couldn't have had a greater captain um, for my first year coaching this team. Um, and they had a very successful season. Yeah. So. Next, I'd like to have uh, Claire Sykes doing come up, uh, head coach of our debate program, along with Aaron Russ. Good evening, my name is Claire Sag Stewen, and as Mr. Erke said, I am the head debate coach at John Marshall. Um, I have known Aaron Ress since he was an eighth grader, and he has been on both of my speech and debate teams for five years now. Um, Aaron got a couple cool awards this year. <laughs> um, the first is he is officially fourth in the state for congressional debate and was recently awarded the Academic All-American Award for the National Speech and Debate Association, reaching 1,700 points in this activity, which is basically unheard of. So through his multiple years of both speech and debate, acting as my captain for multiple years, um, I'm just going to say I don't know what the program is going to look like when Aaron leaves, but I am forever grateful for everything that he brought to our team and to me. Thank you, Aaron. And then our final John Marshall uh, team is is Aspen Smith here. Girls, why don't you come up for dance? These are members of our uh, GM um, dance team and they were winners, uh, bronze medal academic winners uh, for state this year for dance. <laughs> Ryan, I'll call up uh, Jeff Whitney, Mayo High School Activities Director. Thank you. Thanks, board, for having us down here tonight. We appreciate getting the opportunity to celebrate a lot of successes over the winter season. Uh, we have three groups to recognize. One of our groups could not be here tonight, neither the, the kids or uh, the advisor, Aaron Larson, with Science Olympiad. Uh, maybe we can get them down here in the spring when they're all able to attend. They were third place in state for this Science Olympiad competition. Uh, and then I'll introduce next our um, BPA advisor, Pam Preby. All right, thank you for allowing us to be here again tonight to congratulate these young men and all the other BPA folks that excelled so well at uh, the state conference. I, like Shelley, wrote things down, um, and we'll try not to go off of my script because that, it never works well when I do that. So again, thank you for letting us be here tonight. BPA is Business Professionals of America, and I've had the opportunity to work with the students in this organization for about eight years. Um, this year, after Regions, we had about 15 kids qualify for the state competition, which was like the best we've done. Uh, it's just pretty awesome to see all those kids. And they went up to the state conference in March and competed against about 1,200 kids um, in a hotel at the same time that we had Maryland and I think um, Northwestern basketball teams in the hotel. So it was a busy <laughs> hotel. Uh, but in any case, the two young men that I have here tonight uh, would be Alex. He qualified for nationals in our fundamentals of desktop publishing. He placed fifth in the state. This is his first year competing in BPA and just did amazing work. He has done a lot of publications um, for us with our small business, man uh, small business strategies class, um, helped us out when we were doing some fundraising for the Polar Plunge and created some great, great flyers for us. And I need to give a shout out to Miss Oy, who is our graphic design um, teacher who 
taught Alex what he, or Axel, excuse me, what he knows. But Axel, again, amazing young man and did very, very well. And the other rep that we have here tonight is uh, Sammy Shaw. The time is now. Vote for Shaw. <laughs> <laughs> well, Minnesota BPA knew it was the right time, and at our state conference, the delegates, delegates voted him to serve as Minnesota BPA's Vice President of Specialized Activities, which I still am not quite sure what that all in, uh, entails, but it sounds like a fun activity or fun thing to do. Um, but in any case, it didn't end there after he got elected to be a state VP. Um, he earned three top awards. He was first in banking and finance, second in financial math and analysis, and that was out of what, 124 kids, so he did quite well there, and fifth in personal finance. Um, so he and Axel and Anna Medina, who couldn't be here tonight, will be heading to Chicago in May to compete in our national BPA conference. Um, in addition to these, to these two fine gentlemen, we also had about five or six other students qualify for our national competition. Um, in team events, we had um, Anika Hoshi Berg, who actually qualified in two events. She was second in payroll accounting. I tell you, these kids, if you need help financially, I think they can help you out a little bit. Um, Milan Gupta was part of a, a team event. Uh, Anna Medina was part of the team event for small business management and also second in entrepreneurship. And Elena Ripley also was part of the, the team. Um, other folks who were finalists, um, Liam Butterfast, James Prenti, Tony Dumb, God, I just said that, Tony Dunn, um, Will Smith, Tom Sella, Zia Rucker, uh, Taj Bajra, Kellen Berger, and Natalie Hurt. Um, one thing I want to mention again, that a majority of these kids are first time BPA competitors this year. Like, holy buckets, that's just amazing. Um, a couple of these kids were also part of putting on our first annual entrepreneurship fair, um, student entrepreneurs um, in November at Mayo High School, and again, also assisted with promoting and doing some fundraising for the Polar Plunge. And I just have to tell you, um, 33 years almost completed for me, and I tell you, every day that I get a chance to work with young, amazing kids like that, I just feel blessed every day. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to work with the kids, and congratulations to these two and all the other BPA members. I wasn't gonna say anything, but Pam, I taught business education before going into athletics and she took my teaching job when I left. I wasn't gonna say it was 33 years ago, but she said it and you can see the, the program is soaring ever since. So she's done an amazing job. Thanks, Pam. Uh, she's, it is, it's an incredible department. She's done an amazing job. All right, our next uh, uh, activity is our wrestling activity. And this year we got a special Guest, we've got girls wrestling and uh, male wrestling, so uh, a, a new thing here in the state of Minnesota. So Art will tell you a little bit about our success in both. Hi, I'm Art Trimble, uh, head wrestling coach here at Mayo High School. Uh, I have one of my athletes with me, Calder Sheehan. Uh, he placed third in state this year at 145 pounds. It was his third trip to the state tournament. He's only a junior, so he's got his uh, Sight set on the title, so I have to rush through things. Says I think he has uh, another practice at seven o'clock <laughs> over at RCTC for something. So, um, also uh, qualified for state and placing in state is Jeriana Marshall. It was her second time placing in state. Uh, took third at uh, 235 pounds, and she couldn't be with us here tonight. Her mom uh, had surgery, so sometimes the students have to become the caregivers for others that normally are their caregiver. So uh, we're. Uh, thinking about her tonight as she uh, helps her mom through this, uh, but she did a wonderful job. Uh, they were also, uh, Calder was also a captain of our uh, boys team that uh, achieved gold status academically, um, having over a 3-5 team GPA um, for us, and we ended up six total wrestlers, four boys, two girls, making it to the state tournament this year, so a great season for us. Uh, thank you for letting us uh, continue with athletics here in Rochester. Let's keep pushing for better. So, all right, thank you. Have Mr. Queasley pop back up here. We realize we missed one century group. Yes, my apologies. I flipped the page and I missed Victor Robinson. He is going to bring up groups of Model UN and Mock Trial. Thank you. Just wanted to mention hi, I'm Vic Robinson. I teach social studies at Century High School. And uh, in my extended youth, I've learned a few things. One, uh, extracurricular activities, 
so powerful for all parts of a student's development. So I encourage kids to get involved in these things, obviously. Um, just want to make note that uh, our Model UN program in Rochester is one of the tops in the state. And uh, we've had lots of kids involved. Uh, right now, uh, the Center for Youth Voice is in the process of working with the YMCA to expand that program. And you're going to hear about the Center uh, for Youth Voice quite a bit in the future coming up. So that program will be expanding, not only <coughs> Model UN, but youth in government as well. I wanted to um, um, bring up, uh, talk about mock trial tonight, because our team has done exceedingly well. And uh, Ethan Zhang is here, of all of people, <laughs> representing. <laughs> so he's, come on up, come Ethan. On up. And uh, <coughs> Ethan Zhang represent, is representing our team tonight, because Angie Gasner is having his wisdom teeth pulled out again. <laughs> and um, <laughs> our other two leaders are juniors, and they're getting ready for the ACT test tomorrow. So they didn't want to waste any time. Uh, with anything like this, which, <laughs> anyway. So uh, we have about 20 kids on our mock trial team at Century High School, and uh, Ethan is one of the captains. And this year, uh, I should say over the last uh, 15 years, we've been climbing the ladder. And finally, we broke the top 10 this year, and we made it to sixth place in state. Out of 110 teams in the state, that's a pretty big deal for us. Uh, mock trial is a type of competition where uh, the, the Minnesota State Board Association uh, puts together a case, a different case every year. The team has to understand the, the, um, the uh, um, plaintiff side or the prosecution side and the defense side. One year it's a criminal case, one year it's a, a civic case. This year was a criminal case and it's a good thing that uh, we had uh, a criminal lawyer with us working this year, and I'd like to introduce Mr. James Haas as our lawyer coach for our team, and he has a uh, daughter who goes to Century High School, and he just said, I wonder if they need any help at Century with anything. Boy, were we lucky, because uh, uh, James works with the, uh, uh, the Homestead County District Attorney's Office, and he elevated our, our uh, competition level quite a bit, so thank you, James, for all your work. And uh, um, as, it, as it goes, this is a program for teaching kids how to speak well, logically, and um, with a little bit of fight. And you would not want to meet Ethan in a courtroom. <laughs> I promise you, you want him on your side. So good job, Ethan, and all the team for sixth place in state this year. But not le least, I'd like to call up Josh Halverson for STEM Fair and Science Olympiad. I am not involved with Science Olympiad, so if you are, feel free to come up after this. <laughs> um, so STEM Fair is all about getting kids to do science and engineering projects that are exciting to them in a personal way. And we're recognizing um, about 200 plus students who participated in the Rochester Regional STEM Fair, the Minnesota State, State Science and Engineering Fair, and a few students who are going to go to the International Science and Engineering Fair. Um, I just wanted to quickly say that the secret, or not so secret, secret of our program is mentorship. It's how we welcome people into the program. It's kind of our strategy for um, equity in science and hopefully equity in RPS as well. Um, our mentor of the year was Dan Moyer. He is an immunology PhD candidate from the Mayo Clinic Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. Um, he's brilliant, he's funny, the kids loved him, he was relatable. So Dan was one of about, I think, 45 mentors who came to our schools and um, welcomed new kids into the world of science. And then our teacher of the year was Janae Monette at Dakota Middle School. Um, same thing, she facilitated uh, the after school STEM mentorship program there um, and made it special. Um, I'm hoping our students can just very briefly um, say what their projects are about. Um, a few of them are going to the International Science Fair. So I'd go name, grade, school, and then just what your project is very quickly. Hello, my name is Dean Wong. I attend Century High School and I'm a junior. Um, in my project, I created uh, a model using machine learning to predict um, novel drug-drug interactions and I applied it to illicit drugs, which I hope can uh, prevent more overdoses and is also applicable to other drugs. 
Hello, I'm Mr. Walter Gabriel. Um, I'm an aspiring chemist from Mayo High School. I'm in 11th grade. Uh, we had a project um, related to improving cost and sustainability of lithium ion battery anodes. And um, yeah, I hope to improve it in the future. And uh, this is a team project. This. <laughs> Hello, I'm Mirdish Yurkoser. I'm a sophomore at Century High School, and I'm an aspiring physicist. I'm Eric Hill. I am a junior at Century High School, and I was also part of this team project. I also want to recognize Winnie New from Kellogg, who's here today. <coughs> Winnie, are you sixth grade? Sixth grade? Se Winnie's in seventh grade, and she did the hard part of science, which is writing. It's how you get the money. It's how you share your <laughs> results. And she did an excellent job and got the outstanding uh, paper award. And then I think Armida was here too earlier, and she is also just a brilliant science communicator. Um, we have these awards for our um, ISAF, or International Science and Engineering Fair students. So we just wanted to present them here today. I think we had one other miss, missed uh, opportunity here with Science Olympiad Century. Science Olympiad for Century and Mayo. Why don't we have those students please come forward if they're here? I know Cheryl Mortel could not be here this evening, and uh, Mr. Whitney Aaron Larson could not be here this evening. Um, again, outstanding uh, accolades for these groups as well. Um, the Mayo group placed third at state, and I'm sorry. Go ahead and pick up the mic and introduce yourself. I believe I'm the only one from the Century Science Olympiad team here tonight. I'm Erdish Yurkoser, 10th grader. Richard, talk about your accomplishments. I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. So the Century Science Olympiad team placed 10th at state. Not sure exactly who I should be talking to. <laughs> Stay that way. <laughs> All right. So Century placed 10th at state. As Mr. Queasley said, Mayo placed third at state. And personally, I got third place in Fermi questions with my partner, William Yan, who is not here tonight. And I believe we got second place in Robot Tour, thanks to two other incredible students, Finley Bartholomew and Copeland Steele. And I believe we also got several others in the top eight. I'm not exactly sure how many, but... Overall, I think we did well. Of course, Mayo did excellent. They got third place. Outstanding. Thank you. <laughs> and Dr. Clickell again, and board members, thank you for the opportunity this evening. You have all, all the uh, students that were recognized tonight and those who were unable able to be here in your board pack. And I'd like to thank the athletic, or the activities directors, Josh Halverson, and all the uh, coaches and adults that make um, activities and athletics possible. So thank you for being here tonight. Before we move on, there's one recognition that was in the board packet, and I believe that he would not self-identify himself. But Josh Halverson was awarded the Minnesota Academy of Science Inspiring Scientists Award. And I want to say a little bit about Josh being um, in charge of the STEM fair here in Rochester and coordinating uh, these kids going to state and facilitating the mentoring. And I'd just like us to give Josh a round of applause for all the work he's put in. <laughs> Our next item is 4.2, National Assistant Principals Week and National School Librarian Day. On April 4th, we recognized National School Librarian Day. School librarians play a huge role in children's academic success by helping children find resources and creating an environment where students are motivated to learn. We appreciate all the work and organization they do to keep our students' learning environment the best possible. We thank you for sparking a lifelong love of reading by connecting our students to books 
that provide windows into the experiences of others, tools to be informed citizens, and the keys to unlock adventures far beyond their own world. And April 1st through the 5th was Assistant Principals Week. Our dedicated Rochester Public School assistant principals work tirelessly to bolster teachers, motivate students, support their principal, create a positive learning community, and tackle the many unpredictable challenges that land on their desk. Thank you for all you do for our students and staff to make the school day run more smoothly. Item 4.3 is our project search presentation. Superintendent Pickell. Thank you, Chair Nathan. Uh, Kelly Campbell, are you going to come on up? Kelly is, gonna, is our, one of our coordinators of special education services at the secondary level, and she is going to uh, introduce the team from Project Search. I want to say to all of you students, thank you for being very patient. We know it's a long time to wait. It's good to see you again, oh, not over there walking around Mayo Clinic, but here. Uh, and the school board's very excited to recognize your amazing program and the amazing educators who work with you. So, Kelly. Good evening, Chair Nathan, Dr. Pakel, and members of the RPS School Board. My name is Kelly Campbell, and I am the Special Education Coordinator for the Secondary Schools and Programs. Tonight, you'll get to hear about one of our secondary programs available to RPS students with disabilities, Project Search. Through this program, RPS students with disabilities who are entering their final year of school are able to have a unique, hands-on experience at the Mayo Clinic while gaining competitive employment skills. A day at Project Search includes classroom time and experience with one of the three internship rotations they will complete throughout the year. These internships are in different departments throughout the clinic, and some of them are at other campuses. This is a great way to practice many transition skills, such as navigating transportation, that our students with disabilities have been learning about in the classroom. It is exciting to have our students with disabilities working side by side with various Mayo Clinic staff and supervisors. Once they have completed their year at Project Search, they will graduate and pursue employment of their choice. We've had RPS students with disabilities who have been hired as lab assistants, environmental services technicians, housekeepers, utilities workers, and more at Mayo Clinic as well as other area businesses. To share more about the program, I would like to introduce Carlisle Corson, our RPS teacher who works with Project Search, and his panel of students that are here tonight to share their experiences in this unique opportunity. Employment. My name is Benson Art. Project Search has helped me to be more professional while I am at Mayo Clinic. I used to act immature and goofing up around during my day. Now I continue to work on acting an adult and not 
Say Sami, my friend, or Afin, Siri, right? Working at my clinic. I am, I am proud of myself. Hello, hello, my name is Sam Dunn. Party Search has helped me dress more pro professional. I used to wear sweats and a t shirt every day, but now I wear dress pants <laughs> with a boat and dress. Dress shirt every day, dressing professional, have made me feel more confident. I want to thank everybody for the support. Good evening. My name is Luis Guzman. When I started Project Search, I wasn't sure to. I want to stay in program and my attendance was poor, but at my first rotation in food service, all the coworkers treating me with respect. I really enjoy serving food, talking to the people in food service. I would like to get a job food service when I finish a project search. Good evening. My name is Josh Hennenberger. I've changed since I first started Project Search in September 2023, and now I'm getting to know Mayo Clinic better. Whenever I'm stuck with a task that is hard for me, I'll tell Carlisle, the skills trainers, or my supervisor to show me a better way to do the task. I am going to apply at Mayo Clinic because it will be a safe place for me to work. Good evening, my name is Tyler Myland. My, no, my nursing rotation was good for me because I had to talk to people. I, w I went into patients' rooms to stock supplies and I had to talk to patients. Before this rotation, it was hard for me to talk to people. This rotation gave me conferences I will need so I can talk to patients or customers. I am ready to get a job. My name is Kirk Peterson. My name is Kirk Peterson. Since I've started Project Search, I've noticed I've become more confident by accepting feedback better, and I've matured. Project Search has been helpful on making me more professional for those reasons. I'm glad I came to Project Search. Hi, my name is Jane, and I started Project Search in August, which ironically is my middle name. <laughs> I've gotten better at increasing my endurance because of Project Search. I've also gotten better at accepting feedback. I am grateful for Project Search. Hello, I am Hayes Weinberg. Since starting Project Search, I have changed by becoming more confident with talking to new people and learning new jobs. At nursing, I go into a lot of patient rooms uh, to stock uh, supplies. This has helped me be more confident with my uh, communication. I'm learning the importance of uh, being on time to a job, and I'm thankful for being in Product Church, and thank you all for letting us present uh, our point of view. And do you have any questions? Board members, any questions? What was a what was a surprise 
about working at Mayo Clinic. Before you went to Mayo Clinic, you didn't think it would be like that, but then you were like, oh my gosh, this is how they do it. I mean, you already mentioned having to wear like nice clothes. <laughs> I'd like you to talk to my son, who's 24, because <laughs> he doesn't wear nice clothes yet. But what else was something that was a surprise for you with working with uh, you know, adults in one of the like, best hospitals in the world? What's something you'd say? Yeah. Okay, so at Mayo Clinic, so for chronic surgery, we have to show up on time, and when you have to take the bus and get ready, and after you do that, and so project Street is actually an independent work experience for others of communication, teamwork, and how you use your soft skills to be a competitive employee. Awesome. Wow. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Something that surprised you? Yeah. Getting badges. <laughs> you didn't know you get. What did you get a badge for? The badge, oh, badge. Okay, you mean those badges? Those okay. Badges. Duh. <laughs> oh, that's great. Those are cool. That's great. Yeah, we uh, uh, we kept. <laughs> got <it> <laughs> right. So our teacher told him to stop. Oh, got it. That's fantastic. Thank you. No, no, no. I'm envious of your badge. <laughs> I always have cool badges. Anybody else? Maybe one more? Something that surprised you or that you'll think about from your time with Project Search? Yeah. There's definitely one thing that uh, most of the supervisors that we uh, have or have had are, are probably some of the nicest people that we uh, have ever gotten to know or uh, will get to know. So That's nice. it was a nice surprise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so glad you said that because it lets me thank everyone at Mayo Clinic for this. So thank you very much. You guys did amazing, amazing work. And we will see you at your graduation, which uh, is another highlight of the year. So congratulations. <laughs>
we don't have that level of funding, so the proposal is to increase it for a f fiscal year 2025 if we're able to do that. Uh, there was also discussion of the READ Act, and the author of that bill is Senator May Quaid. She wants to make this bill work for districts and is interested in any input from districts about, in particular, if any teachers or other staff are watching, um, if there's any stories about how the READ Act funding has been challenging here locally or any stories or ideas to improve the READ Act. Again, she wants to make that bill work for all of our districts. Um, getting a little bit in the weeds, there was a discussion of local option revenue to increase that, provide some modifications to provide equalization. There's also recognition that that likely may not happen this year, but it's the type of thing that um, uh, legislators are looking at and talking about this year so that it can be presented in future years. And finally, something that hadn't even been on our radar but may impact RPS is that uh, there's some issues with food service funding surpluses and some creative ways in a new bill to um, perhaps be able to shift that back into things that can assist not just with the food service but with the facilities related to food service. So we are tracking those bills closely. Again, there's um, about 25 legislative days left and we'll have another in, uh, update when, um, when we're back, in, back here in front of the board and or at the end of the session. Yeah, board members. Um, I would just like to remind people that we have a school board listening session scheduled for April 19th at Franklin Elementary from 5 to 7 p.m. And our co-hosts for that event will be Pomoja Women. Item 4.5, School Board Academy. The 2024 School Board Academy will be held on April 25th, 2024 and April 30th, 2024 from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. here in the Edison Boardroom. The content will be identical on both days, so you don't need to attend both if you're interested. School Board Academy is an important opportunity to learn about the responsibilities, requirements, resources, policies, and practices related to being a member of the Rochester School Board. Participating in School Board Academy will be very informative to individuals considering running for the Rochester School Board or community members looking for a deeper understanding of the work of the School Board. We have a sign-up form available on the district website under School Board Elections or through the direct link that's available in this assembly um, agenda item tonight. We also have updated our School Board Elections webpage with detailed information regarding the School Board election for School Board seats 1, 3, and 7. The uh, School Board Elections webpage has key dates, including dates of the elections, if a primary election is needed, and the period for filing for office, which begins May 21st. The next items on our agenda are consent items 5.1 through 5. Point 15. Would any board member like any item removed from the consent agenda for separate consideration? Move approval. Second. second. It has been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda has been approved. Board members, it's one minute before seven. Would you like to continue on to our focus topic or take a break before we dive into our agenda? Keep going? Okay. The next item on our agenda is 6.1. It's a focus topic, our Youth Empowerment Strategy Update. Superintendent Pacal. Thank you, Chair Nathan and board members. Uh, I already see Will Ruffin II, our Executive Director of Equity and Engagement, coming up, and Sarah Louise Henry, Henry who now has the title of Coordinator of Youth Empowerment. Um, as board members are aware, our strategic plan um, is rolling out in three waves. And that is uh, for many different reasons, not least of which is that it is such an ambitious plan that if we tried to do everything in one year, uh, it would be impossible. And so each wave has had a design phase and then we move into implementation. During the design phase, we have looked at research, we've looked at best practice, and especially we've engaged diverse stakeholders here in Rochester. When we move into implementation, that's where we begin to think, what's it going to take to bring this thing to life, whatever the initiative is, at both the system level and at the school level. So we are now in the midst of our third wave, that final wave, where we have design efforts underway for the last critical components of our strategic plan. And uh, Will and Sarah Louise have been leading the design phase of our youth empowerment strategy. 
And so what they're going to give the board and others who are watching now is really an early update on work in progress. I'll be working with both of them over the summer, as we did with the previous two waves of our strategic plan, to translate these ideas into specific strategies and initiatives that we'll be integrating next year into our DISCs, or our district-wide initiatives for systems change, and our SKIPs, or our school continuous improvement plans. But this has been a rich discussion that uh, Sarah Louise and Will have engaged in, uh, and I'm grateful to them and the other folks that have been a part of this process. When we developed our strategic plan over nine months in 2021 and 2022, one of the loudest themes came from students themselves. And it was they wanted two things to be happening. One, they wanted their voices to be heard about their schools, about our communities. And two, they wanted the chance to lead. This is not a generation that is waiting around to ask to improve things in their schools and their communities uh, and in our world. And so what uh, under Will and Sarah Louise's uh, leadership has become youth empowerment really has, from the origins of our strategic plan, had those two indispensable parts of the strategy of youth voice and youth leadership. And the last thing I'll say before I hand it over is those two things are related but different. A student who doesn't ever want to lead anything, because leaders have followers in some way, still wants to be heard, wants their perspective to be heard. But leadership also doesn't just happen. It's developed, it's practiced, it's supported. And uh, as we all know, we have more than enough challenges for today's young people to help us lead uh, and solve. So Will and Sarah Louise, thank you for this overview of really pretty near the conclusion of our design phase. And we'll be looking in the fall to come back and share with uh, the school board and the community the specific ways we're going to translate this into action. All right. Chair Nathan and school board members, Superintendent Bikel, thanks for having us here at the board table again on what turned out to be a great night of student celebration. So I think it's only right for us to talk about youth voice and uplifting them tonight through what we have for you um, with our presentation tonight. Um, I'm really playing second chair to the Sir Louise show. <laughs> Sir Louise has done a lot of the work. Um, I've been supporting her throughout that, but a lot of the legwork has been hers and she, and she deserves that recognition. So just keep that in mind. She's been uh, leading all the work for us. So this is already off to a fantastic start. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again for having us. Um, very excited to be here. There we go. So this is kind of the you are here map of the strategic plan. And um, one of the fantastic pieces of youth voice and student leadership is that it does intersect with some of the other um, initiatives that are taking place. Um, we look at strengthening supports and the mental health aspect of that. Um, creating community uh, by increasing belong that sense of belonging with students, and then even empowerment and looking at how this lends itself into those post-secondary pathways. So we have pulled together a dynamic team of um, staff members who really were committed to seeing how this fits in their sector. So we have admin, we have um, people who work in special ed, and even though we are looking primarily at um, high school, we did have um, some input from early childhood as well as um, because we're wanting to look at that for the future. So this was our dynamic group. Yep, starting off in high school with the intent of trickling down to middle school and elementary school. So this, this is just the starting point. Uh, this was our charge, uh, using an old teacher trick of highlighting the words that we want students to gravitate <laughs> towards. Uh, just basically strengthening the capacity of our students so that they have a vehicle to express their perspectives and have an avenue for leading change. Some of the questions that got at our work again were, how do we get the perspectives of our students in the forefront so that we can use that in, a, in order to make change going forward? How do they see themselves providing leadership currently? And then lastly, are there any new tools that we, can, that we should consider when building this module out? Some additional questions we're looking at um, also new vehicles for youth leadership and how can we implement those in our schools. And also when we are talking with students, what are some of the aspects of school that they want to talk about and share their perspectives? And when we look at leadership, 
what are the skills that are important to them? Not the things that we think they may need or we know in the future you're gonna need this. What are the things that are important to them that they want to build upon? So in this process, we looked at analyzing what are the current opportunities and then where are some spaces where we can improve. We also researched best practices and um, the impact of student leadership and youth voice on academics, and then we looked at the programming and frameworks and what are some things that are happening in other districts and in other um, sectors that we could potentially take. Um, so then we asked the question, what does, student, what does student leadership look like? Right? So we have, these are some, um, this is an example, the top left is um, K-Kids, which is a leadership group of fourth graders at Riverside, and they, <coughs> do all, say, all sorts of empowerment type activities like leaving kind messages on their peers' lockers or helping out at events. And so starting that leadership early. And then this uh, right next to where it says, what is your voice? That's an example of one of our student school board meetings. And so when we looked at kind of how we were gonna find some sort of common definition, we pulled a few. So the first one, when we're looking at what, how do we define youth voice? We're looking at do youth have opportunities to select topics or identify the needs that are important to them within their communities, both in the school and outside of school? And are they able to visualize where they fall in that and how they are able to impact change? Um, looking at have they had the opportunity to lead a small or large group or take part in mentorship. We heard one of our students talking about you know, that process of having somebody walk through them with it and how empowering that can be. And so also practicing skills such as organization, being flexible and fluid when there are setbacks, and also um, receiving perspective from people with different viewpoints and learning how to value that, which we know even in this space that that is something that is relevant and valuable. So we look at types of student voice, and um, this we pulled up the spectrum of student voice oriented activity. And we look at being heard, right? So we are hearing students, and so that's volunteering, having students talk about um, what's important to them, sharing feedback. And we are doing some of this within um, our district. I think of things like having our students at a panel for a new teacher, right? Sharing their perspectives. Then we're looking at participation. Are students able to participate in meetings with decision makers? Well, we have some of that. Um, it does tend to particularly fall in um, more of a formal setting, right? But while we're looking at this continuum, we're also looking at how do we extend into activism and leadership? So how do we get into looking at those problems and then that co-planning piece and having that shared responsibility for outcomes? So then another, so when we look at student leadership, another definition um, was looking at students being in the position to influence and motivate and guide others towards achievement of a goal. And so we had these, we had these definitions and we talked about it, uh, but we wanted to have some insight for the students. And one thing that we've been really intentional about in this work is not speaking for the students about youth boys. That defeats the whole purpose. So in a way to do that, we wanted to get some uh, perspective from students right here at RPS. What I think youth voice is, is making sure everyone in the community is heard and the representation of the problems and daily life of the students. Being able to talk in the classroom. Yeah. I think youth voice is the youth advocating for what they believe in. I think our youth is our future generation, and what we say now impacts future generation or introducing new ideas that can lead to many changes in our community. I feel like the youth voice, just like, in my perspective, means we go through the same struggles that adults aren't going through. Uh, youth voice means um, just getting an opinion from different age groups, different people who are seeing different things. Youth voice is 
impactful and um, it's just important overall. I'm a leader, help with my friends. I would definitely say that you do not have to hold a specific um, club position or student government position. If you ran for a position and odds are kind of out of your favor, I wouldn't get too discouraged because I learned that you can be a student leader without having one of those positions. Because as long as you devote your time to change, your hard work will not go on. Student leadership, what it looks like to me is um, whenever there's a problem between a student and a student, not only can an adult deal with this, students can. And like I do always, I ask my friends for help whenever I have a problem or anything. Um, you can always talk to your peers and not just adults. A leader to me means like somebody who takes charge and knows what they're doing to make the world a better place. a wealth of knowledge our students have. Right? We just have to ask them and we have to listen and then we have to follow up. And so we also did, there we go. We also did some research around best practices and how this work can positively impact academics. So some of the um, research shows that being a leader does enhance academic performance both in the short and long run. Um, having those experiences may sometimes take time, and that is something that we hear a lot, right? So when you're in extracurricular activities or some of those leadership things that take place during school, um, there is sometimes the concern that it takes away from study time. But the research does show that although those activities may reduce some study time, it improves the overall academic performance because it improves learning consciousness. And I think we saw some examples of that tonight. So just continuing on, if we are able to honor student voice in meaningful ways, then we can get to a place where we can have um, an increase in improvement and uh, better focus on higher standards for all of our students. If we can also get to a place where we can build the systems where their opinions are shared collaboratively with teachers, Collaborative, collaboratively with our administrators, we can get to that space where we can have a higher potential for increased problem solving too, which is what we want for all of our students. I do want to point out the picture on there is also a student-led um, event that was a culture night held on by male high school students. So y'all can read this here, but on the left side, we just have all of the mechanisms that were used for gathering some of the data throughout this whole process over a few months, just a few months, right? And then on the right side, you have um, the student groups that were given um, the, the feedback from us. So ninth grade through 12th grade, so we did kind of pull all of the students, but it was from all of the high schools, so ALC, Century Mail, John Marshall, um, and both students in special education and general education programs as well including our multilingual learners. Um, and I wanted to pull some quotes from some of the focus group discussions. Um, one was, I became a leader in my club because a teacher pulled me in. Our morning meetings, this is another one, um, our morning meetings help me feel like I belong because it's a judgment-free zone and we can, where we can say anything. And finally, another student said, I wanted to be a leader when I was a freshman but didn't know anyone. Now I'm a junior and I don't know how. And so, like I said, we did see some of these in the activities section, but these are some of our current examples of things that are amazing and taking place right here in RPS. We have um, different affinity groups, such as um, our GSA groups, um, and also our prayer groups. There's also um, groups that talk about global affairs where students get a chance to talk about things that are important to them. Something to highlight. Also, we do currently survey our students. There are multiple schools where restorative circles are taking place. Some of those um, are leaning towards are becoming student-led, so that's exciting. And then um, also looking at those student panels that I mentioned before. 
examples of leadership are things like the culture nights. Um, the junior equity team at Dakota put on a culture night. It was in a slide earlier. Um, and looking at things like the SOS group, which provides resources for students, or a TAPS group that's peer mentorship. So really some of those things that students are asking to see, they are involved in it. But we're wanting to enhance access to those things and representation. We also learned about our gaps in our areas of improvement throughout our schools. And one of the big things was increasing our mentorship opportunities for more students, not just the students who may know someone or who's, who's taking that class and has that opportunity, but all of our students throughout the district. How do we connect them to mentors that they can get to that place that they want to be as well? Um, we definitely need more student-led projects and initiatives. Again, you heard many examples of that tonight. Imagine if we multiply that by 10, by 100 what our students will be capable of. Another big thing that really came through, we need better feedback mechanisms. We're really good about listening to students, not so good about reporting back to them what we heard from them, and then actually doing something about what they share with us. That really stood out. Collaboration and integration, I think you talked about that earlier, but not just using the students for their voice and our ideas, but how do we build ideas together? How do we come up with new, something new, because the adults can't think of everything. If we partner with our students, maybe we can come up with something fresh that we didn't think of in the first place. Sense of belonging was also there. If we can increase that sense of belonging, then our students may feel a little bit um, braver to step into some of those extracurricular activities that we've seen um, throughout the, the night tonight. And so these are our recommendations that we are going to touch upon. Starting with developing a comprehensive student leadership plan. So we want to be, this is a plan within the plan. So we have our larger plan, but this is being really intentional about how do we create a sustainable um, student leadership process. And so part of that is conducting at least three professional development sessions for youth that really helps to focus on those leadership skills and personal development. So we would take some of the information where students are telling us what skills and abilities they would like to develop and then um, provide professional development to help them grow those skills. And we also wanted to um, connect to the gaps that were addressed in the previous slide so that we really are making sure that we are answering the, answering the call to the gaps that were identified. And so some of what that may look like is also bringing in external uh, resources to empower student leaders and again using that feedback. And this is our group, um, our Youth Participatory Action Resource Group. Research group. So another part of that will be looking at how do we increase opportunities to uplift students or youth voice, and really finding ways to engage students who, are, who have historically been disengaged or disconnected, um, people that we are not hearing from. We want to know, learn, learn more from students who our school system is working for and also from those who have some fantastic suggestions for us that we need to listen to. And so we want to increase uh, the number of youth-led initiatives and projects within the next school year so that we're really looking at what's important to our students. And this one really goes with the last one um, as far as expanding access for leadership opportunities. But the goal will be just to increase the leadership opportunities and roles that the students actually have within their high schools throughout the um, next school year. Um, one example of that would be to expand our access to training. So like Sarah Louise said, when they say these are the skills that we want to have developed, we need to be able to, to help them actually develop those skills so that they can turn into the, into the next thing. Right now, we don't have any way for developing our students into um, whatever they tell us. We have to ensure inclusi inclusivity and diversity in our leadership roles to make sure that they reflect our student body. Not all, our, not all of our leadership opportunities currently uh, reflect all students represented in RPS. 
I mean, because this is um, a culture change, right? We're looking at now we're really collaborating and how can we collaborate better with students? And so we want to help prepare staff for this culture shift and uh, this partnership with students. And so part of that will be training our staff members in um, at least two youth inclusive strategies to really help build upon the skills that we have to support our youth. And that looks at collaboration and integration and also sustainability. So we'll, we will try it and then also figure out ways to keep that going. So this just speaks a little bit more to that. Um, <coughs> one of the strategies that we did look at that really exciting is um, potentially doing some sort of student-led conference where students are able to build those leadership skills and then um, communicate that to staff so we can talk about needs and teach us how we can do better. So looking at some uh, potential strategies and frameworks, one of the um, systems that we identified was the Anoka Hennepin Student Curriculum Advisory Committee. And this was created as a way to have students be part of the curriculum review and selection process. And so students are selected by staff or they're self-selected and they're able to come and engage and review um, and provide feedback about curriculum and programming and assessment. Um, another piece is where students are able to take then their feedback from some of the things that they've seen in the curriculum and give that, provide that feedback to their district. Um, so that's a really cool thing that they're doing there. And that also aligns with what we were talking about, about that collaboration. We have talked about doing some curriculum work with students and getting that feedback, but this is just a structure that maybe we can take bits and pieces from. And so this just shows some of the structure of how theirs works and what schools are involved in that. And so it's, it's students from multiple high schools that are coming together to do this. And I, think, then, oh, I think what Sarah Louise just shared is important because we are trying to think about ways to improve our student school board and how we could change and beef that up some. So that was just one model that we we're considering be a big improvement in that area. We also researched this Youth Truth organization, and I think it shows a lot of promise. As you can see there, it really has a, a, a pathway for uplifting the voice of the students by giving the schools the tools to actually get the perspective of the students, but then actually showing how to analyze that into something that's operational. I think that's something that's actually missing in RPS. And if they have the, the mechanism to do that already, then that's something that we should ex explore instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. Some of the subjects that come, the subjects that come with, with the Youth Truth Survey are the ones listed on the left. So looking at that engagement, belonging, um, academic challenge, college and career readiness. So we're looking at some of these things that we're already saying are important and that our district um, values additional topics that we can look into is adding student voice and leadership which right now we aren't we don't have a method of fully getting that information back in a structured way also school safety and then looking at the emotional and mental health that our students have already uplifted that they would like to see improve so you know you had a chance to kind of take a look at this we won't fully go through the phases of the process but really, it's just an onboarding process of finding out what our district is wanting to learn more about, how we want to get that information. Then we gather the feedback. And while the feedback is coming, there's ongoing support from the program. Um, as we're getting responses, there'll be a, a tracker saying, hey, here's a way to get, you have this many responses, here's a way so you can get some more or here are some additional supports that you may need during that time. And after, there's the piece about really looking at making meaning of the data and doing a debrief to um, highlight things in the results and um, help with that interpretation piece. Uh, there's also, sorry, I wanted to also highlight that ongoing piece that's a little bit different from uh, Panorama because 
one of the things that we were thinking is what's different than what we already have? Well, with Youth Truth, um, it really focuses on school climate, um, looking at that continuous improvement, and then also putting the data back into the hands of students, which really aligns with what we're talking about with both student leadership and youth voice. Um, so <coughs> students do have the opportunity to do a workshop where they're able to look at the data and um, engage in activities that will, they'll leave the workshop with an action plan draft and recommendations that can be used by school leaders and potentially districts and school boards to really promote those uh, strategic plans. Also, this uses the um, two frameworks for the SEL model, the Cassell SEL model, and the Racial Equity Institute groundwater theory. And so just some different um, baselines for that make it a little bit different than the panorama survey. And focusing on classroom, school, and community rather than just the individual student. And as we're looking at belonging, that's very important to look at students holistically as well. So the impact, we just wanted to highlight some places where um, they are using this survey, even it's as close as um, Pine Island. So we have some neighbors using the survey. And um, one of our quotes would be, our teachers have valued this information and have asked that we survey our students again this year so they can respond to the data. Just another quote we wanted to read out loud just to put this into the space, but Youth Truth is a great tool that gives school administrators important insight into their school's performance. So how do we actually know we're doing what we said we wanted to do? So the reports and, and throughout the program can help us figure that out. And also we now have the information and expertise to better understand our students, catalyze changes, and monitor improvement. So really using that data as an ongoing piece of how we can improve in a tangible way that not only are we able to see, but students are able to see it too. And then the last quote um, comes from the dropout prevention person in Texas. Our district and students are better off because of the student feedback results we have used to inform campus and district level planning. So we can actually use what our students are telling us to help us make plans at the district level. That's different than what we've been doing before also. Now it's the money part. Everyone's favorite part except for jobs. <laughs> so if we look at um, administering this survey, just at our high schools, like we said, that's where we wanted to start. So ALC, Century, John Marshall, Mayo, and RPS Online, it's just about $1,700 per school for a total of about $8,200. If we wanted to also add the family survey piece or a staff survey, that would be another $600 per school. The reason we broke it up like this is so you as the school board can direct us which pieces you're interested in and which pieces you aren't. I'll keep going. So the project management piece, as you can see there, is included in the price of the survey. So that's where they're gonna help generate the reports um, and then help us learn how to read the reports so that we can make more informed decisions. They help us uh, with the debriefing then the part that's actually pretty good is at the bottom where it says additional topics there. If we wanted to dig into the mental health of our students, we could do that for another $100. If we wanted to dig into um, student voice and leadership, which is actually the purpose of this, that's only another $100 that we can tack on to the initial survey price. So if we did all of those things together, we're looking at about $15,000. Now one thing we did say, we wanted to um, improve the opportunities for professional development for our students. If we did that, uh, the Youth Truth organization would actually come to town and help um, uh, train about 50 students for a price of $5,000. There's also a virtual training that's about $3,500, but again, that's for about 50 participants or so. And also just to reiterate that the beauty of this is that you, we take what we need, we leave what we don't, um, we have the opportunity to kind of build it into what we need and also potentially align it with other initiatives. So for next steps, you heard uh, Superintendent Bikel kind of allude to this, but we need to build a team together that's gonna work on that implementation plan. What is this gonna look like uh, moving forward? We have to find a financial plan. How are we gonna pay for this? How can we sustain it going forward if we decide that we like it? 
And then we have to form that comprehensive student leadership plan that we've been talking about already. Director Garcia. Yeah, so I have been, it's since we came back from the MSBA conference, it's just sort of been rattling around in my brain after sitting in a little symposium of students saying that they are on their school board, not a student school board, but they are a non-voting member of their own school board. And many of them, as interesting as it sounded, I think they sometimes feel like they get lost in the sauce, right? There's, they don't maybe understand the rules of engaging in the process, and they're not really sure like when they should be allowed to speak unless somebody sort of invites them to do so. Um, and then some other kids are, I think, probably more just like me, and they'll just sort of throw their voice in there, um, but unsure of their value in the room always. And I think people show that they appreciate the perspective, but I was thinking how could we or do we as a district honor that voice? Because we do make, every decision we make affects our students. Um, and while I think um, Dr. Marvin does an excellent job bringing the report back about student school board, it's not like we're hearing, as we do with like public comments or in our emails, students telling us explicitly their thoughts on the referendum or Pinewood turning into an early learning school and things like that. And those are the sorts of things I would actually like to hear from them. Um, and I'm wondering if this is an opportunity to develop whatever version RPS might use for that. So even if we don't have a student on the school board, might there be another mechanism or an improvement to student school board that would bring that information to us? And have you thought about what that might look like? I don't know if that's part of your plan, but this feels like it's on that vein for me because I want to invite it more than we have it for sure. I think you, you word it great when you say that there are some students who don't, who aren't necessarily ready to come and um, be as vocal about that, but they still have a voice and opinion. And so when we look at building that student leadership plan, um, really looking at how do we build that with students, right? So we may not know how to build that structure where students are able to authentically get that message here. But I think we have been operating in systems that we have put together, even things like student school board, like we have put it together, we have structured it. And so how do we then build something with students um, so that they're not feeling like they're tokenized or like um, we're just hearing what they're saying but not doing anything. So I think that would fall in part of that student leadership plan and really working with students to create that. Yeah, thank you. I would just add that we're getting some of that with our superintendent as he attends the student school board meetings. He's having great dialogue with our students about the things that they see as far as our district. I also think it's, it's a little bit bigger than that. So if we can create a vehicle where they can have this dialogue with their administration and their school, now we have every school doing that. Now we're not, we're, we're not waiting on one student to come and tell the board what they're thinking but we're actually having those conversations with all of our schools. That, that to me makes it more powerful than waiting for a student to come to us. They're already gonna be on the ground level doing the work, so it's a both and. Yes, we can get them coming to us, but at the same time, we need to empower them to learn how to have these conversations and work with their building administrator and the building teachers so that they can get accomplished what they wanna get accomplished within their schools also. Director. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure where to start with this, so it'll probably be a little bit more um, incohesive than I usually am. Um, I really appreciated the, of what you said about the intentionality of developing leadership. And I was looking at the um, mission statement on the back wall. Our mission is to inspire, challenge, and empower all students with the knowledge and skills required to reach their full potential to contribute to future generations and to become involved members <laughs> of a global community. So that contribution to future generations is really critical. And we have to have leaders to do that. And this is, this is what I see happening here, is that we're not only focused on reading, math, 
science and whatever the other one was. But how are we teaching them basically civic engagement, being involved in their community, being involved in the world? Um, these are the students who are going to be making huge decisions um, about many of us here for their future. And I want to see those qualities that you're developing with your students in them to make those decisions rather than somebody who has become a leader just because there is a vacuum and they have kind of, you know, well, I'm going to be the leader, but it's not always working out as well as we might hope. So um, the respect, the belonging, all these things are so important. And I guess I didn't really have a question here, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to your coming back and sharing more about how this is going. Um, I hope everybody else on the board is as excited about this as I am. I think it is just tremendous that we are finally really getting into some of the real nitty grit, gritty, nitty gritty of our mission statement that I just read from the back wall. So thank you, thank you so much. Director Cook. Uh, so I, um, I, I, I view this kind of in two different buckets, the, the presentation that I heard. There's developing student leadership for the purpose of developing student leaders and developing their leadership skills. And then there was, I, I, got, I got a little bit lost with a lot of the um, youth truth survey stuff, which seemed a lot more related to harvesting or identifying the voice of students so that it can be used, those ideas can be leveraged and ideally reported back. But I, I, I love the ideas about mentorship. I love the ideas about um, um, additional committees both to get some um, useful inputs from our students and, and harvest the potential in their voices, but also as a mechanism to kind of have a farm team of some of the uh, future student leaders. The only way to learn leadership is you just got to start doing it. And everybody that starts is bad when they start. That, that, is, that is part of it. Um, and so I think, you know, creating some additional opportunities for students to rise up, but I, I would have just naively, my assumptions would have been to start with more like entrepreneurial opportunities for students to start their own group, to do their own thing, and like providing the supports that enable that to happen. Um, and maybe I'm missing something in the youth truth, so I'm gonna stop before I, maybe I've, I've like missed a total assumption, but is there, you mentioned that part of it was providing that feedback to students. Are students involved in some material way in the youth truth survey data? Is it an example of a, platform for students to develop leadership potential and not just another way for them to provide their inputs? Yes, so I think you answered the, the question within your explanation there. <laughs> so we are taking their uh, feedback that we're giving us, and basically that's for the adults to show us this is what our students said is missing throughout our school district. But then the second piece of that is actually helping the students to develop those skills and lead some of those things that they just told us was missing within our schools. So it's really a both end. They are giving us the feedback, but then at the same time, we're gonna develop them into being that entrepreneur, into being that lawyer that we just talked about, and all these other things that they're interested in. So it's a both end. And also that piece of leadership, or of ownership. And so we give, we give surveys, and students many times will offer their feedback, and then not know what happens after that. It just mm -hmm. goes off into, you know, our information, but they don't have it. And so one of the pieces of this is really having students be involved in looking at the data, and that way they're able to help us develop the goals and really analyze what are the needs, what are the strengths, what are some opportunities where um, we can collaborate to move forward. And that lends itself to the leadership piece of it, too. This is built together. Got it, thanks. Director Barlow. Uh, couple things. First of all, um, I appreciate uh, seeing as a disc group charge um, that within your presentation. Uh, I think it helps for me as a member of the board uh, better understand uh, the value of and need for 
uh, strengthen the capacity of students, uh, ultimately allowing them to express their perspectives and to lead change. Um, that is so powerfully stated, and I appreciate you including that. Uh, also, um, having done the research and being able to identify the existence of current, um, I'll call them as a block, affinity groups, um, it, it's good that you have already acknowledged the existence of and perhaps are already mining, if you will, uh, that uh, 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 student voice and leadership uh, capacity that those groups represent. Then finally, just a question as it may relate to um, a tool that is, is currently in use. Uh, will Zello in any uh, way be able to be used to potentially identify uh, youth voice and or student leadership, uh, youth voice need and or student leadership capacity? Are there any questions designed to perhaps call that out or to um, uh, probe to see if there is uh, interest that even students themselves may not be aware of. Do you know if Zello currently has that capacity or are you envisioning that uh, uh, that tool uh, be used to perhaps acquire that? As far as the youth voice, I'm not sure if Zello can pull that out. Zello's job is to um, match students with a career path that they may not have been thinking about or deepen, deepen a career path that they are currently so as far as getting the youth voice out of Zello, I don't think that's the right tool. Okay. But I can look into that for you. Well, I think, though, if I can say, Director Barlow, that I, I agree with Will about the youth voice, but the youth leadership piece, I think, is going to be a slam dunk. Because what Zello will be doing in terms of the, the personal career interest inventories, the personal strength inventories, kids often identify, I want to lead. Um, or there are tools in <coughs> Zello that actually identify kids who have the habits and orientations to lead, but don't self-identify as leaders. So I do think it's going to be a powerful way for us to have a way to, uh, one of the quotes that Sarah Louise read, which I uh, loved, it was sort of in there about, you know, tapping kids on the shoulder and saying, hey, you can lead. Like, sometimes that's what a kid needs to know, but we need to know to tap them on the shoulder. And so I think that what Zella will do, uh, not just in the area of leadership, but in the area of many other aspects, will allow us to proactively find the kids who want this opportunity, or who might have the skills and energies and passions, but don't self-identify as leaders. So I think that that is, uh, I think that's a powerful piece of this. Um, and as Director Cook just said, coming out of our strategic plan, there really are two related but distinct parts of youth empowerment. There's youth voice, and then there's the youth leadership. And I think we'll summarize the synergy. Um, we, we had some kids tell us, I don't want to lead anything, but I want people to listen to me. Like, and we, other, we had other kids I say, that. I want to lead stuff. Like, I, you know, and so that was where we distilled into that those sort of two pieces that are related but distinct. Something else I'm thinking about, uh, Director Barlow. Um, Zello just opened up a feature where we can have what we're calling work-based learning where organizations within our community can post something on Zello. Um, let's say, Justin, you have an internship available or there's a job opportunity available at X Corporation or um, maybe someone just wants to volunteer. So as we're mapping out the career interests of our students, we now have the ability to, ma to match them with someone in the community. And when we do that, that's gonna start working on those uh, leadership skills that you were just mentioning. So the tool itself may not explicitly say this is for youth voice, but I think, like Dr. Pakel said, we're going to start pulling some of that out um, in a way that wasn't intended. Dr. Marvin. Just very quickly, thank you so much for the presentation. And I think um, that this is so appropriate it's, that it is one of the fundamental tenets of the strategic plan because I see that this is the way our district is going. We want every child to know they can become a change agent. They have something to offer. Um, and as, like adults, I think, there are a lot of kids who think if I have a big voice, I'm going to lead, or I'm simply not capable of leading anything. And so what this does is to sort of highlight the fact that we need to help teach kids and adults that leadership is more than just 
being at the head of the line or having the loudest voice, that there's problem solving, that you have to engage, you have to be able to work with other people and inspire other people. And I think it's one of the most important skills we can send our students out with, and for that matter, that we can help all adults learn. I think it makes us better people when we feel that we can be responsible for ourselves and to help others at the same time. And I think that's the kind of student we want to um, send out of the school district. And, uh, and I think that this can become a regular classroom thing too, where teachers will be more inclined to have students determine and then lead their own projects that are meaningful to them. So I see this being part of how we envision education in general uh, changing in this district. Stupid learning. <laughs> Um, I appreciate this work. I think we could probably talk about this all night. Um, I just had some thoughts based on what Dr. Garcia was saying earlier about um, involving students in potentially our work and thinking about the structures that this board has put in place, things like the ABCD calendar, that we have a structure like that that students could look at and if there is something that sparks their interest, we have a process now that they could start on that and, and provide voice to us. I think about even the next agenda item is the SRO contract. We wanted for years to hear from students about that issue. I know that there's been challenges about how to do that and how to present it and how to make sure that students are safe with that information. But that's the problem I think the students could help us solve is that if they can figure out a way to overcome some of those concerns and barriers and you know, grow with us so that we can do that in a way that's safe for them but still get that information and that data would be amazing. And I think that's just an example of a structure you know, that perhaps could be used um, to implement some of this moving forward. I also just really want to comment, I love the fact that you're including staff development in this, that I think that that's, a, I, I'm not sure that we can implement this without that staff development as well that we need that support for the students um, so that everyone's on board moving this forward um, to um, give the students those skills that they want. I, I, I love that concept of not only asking them what they want and what they want to learn and what they want to develop, but providing that to them and you know providing feedback and, and uh, um, helping with their growth in those areas that they're asking for. And then that feedback loop to make sure that it happens. I love that. So one of the things I'm excited about in terms of developing these um, skills to use their voice and empowering them to do so is I think sometimes when we think about high school students and wanting to have their voice in decision making, we sometimes just think about their four years of high school or, or, or what they can influence before they graduate. But I think they're our best internal focus group to look backwards at their previous eight K through eight years, especially as we're up, uh, revising curriculum and revising instruction. And for those younger students, they just experienced it most recently. So if we can empower them to use their voice to also help us reflect on how we can improve for the next group of students coming up, um, that might be our best source of information on you know, the kind of real-time changes that we need to make. But, I recognize that we have to develop their skills in it, we have to develop their confidence in it, because I don't know how many of them have thought of saying, hey, remember that thing I did in fifth grade? Maybe we could make that better for you know, my, my younger sibling or something like that. So I'm really excited about all this work and appreciate all the work that you all have put in so far to, to, to plan for this while simultaneously activating the youth voices that we have. We're not just sitting, putting a plan together and saying, students wait until we've got everything organized. There's already, we're seeing um, the benefits of that. So thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, you. thank you. To be continued. All right, board members, it's 7.50. We're moving on or do we need to take a break? Quick break. break. Quick break, all right, we will re, uh, we're adjourned at 7.50, we'll be back at eight o'clock.
board is back in session at 8.01 p.m. Our next agenda item is a prep for action, item 7.1, school resource officer update and consideration of contract renewal. Superintendent Pickell. Thank you very much. I am board members going to um, do the honors of a brief presentation here in order to keep the presentation concise and at a clip and saving some time should board members want to have it with some of our colleagues um, who really lead this work. And so I want to ask uh, Chris Langen, who's our director of school support, and Joel Blonick, Sergeant Joel Blonick from uh, Rochester Police Department, and Julie Clayman, who coordinates our safety efforts to come on up so that um, should board members want to either ask any questions of um, uh, these colleagues um, uh, or engage in a discussion, that is very much something that we can do. As you are all aware, the contract with the Rochester Police Department for the services of six officers who serve in our schools is one that is an annual contract that renews unless either party takes action to change or terminate it. And uh, this has been a major subject of the board's work uh, since I got to Rochester two and a half years ago. As board members know, we have looked at the research with the help of a doctoral student at the University of Minnesota. We convened a task force uh, that uh, made recommendations on a new memorandum of understanding, which subsequently with board leadership, we integrated into a major revision of the contract. We also looked um, most recently at alternatives to school resource officers and some of the experiences in school districts that have made that transition. This presentation tonight is in the prep for action category. As such, we are not asking for any voter action. And as board members are aware, um, in, a in essence, you could take action by taking no action, or you could choose to uh, uh, move forward in the different way in the contract. One uh, uh, data point that I want to thank Dr. Marvin for highlighting, the version of the contract with Ro City of Rochester that is posted in assembly in our board web platform has some dates that might uh, ca cause close readers to wonder because it suggests that this is a contract for 2023. And the rationale for that is that in the previous years since that time, the board did not take action to change the contract. And so it remains in force because it rolled over. I think to Dr. Marvin's perceptive point, um, even if uh, the board chooses to take no action on the substance of the contract, I think it would make sense to update those dates so it's clearer that this, is, this would be in force should the board choose to uh, continue the contract between July of 2024 and July of 2025. But it's the old dates because it rolled over. So with that, let me uh, hit a few highlights here. Um, in particular, some very, very important data that I want to credit the board for pushing us to work with uh, Sergeant Blonick and Rochester Police Department to put together, which is what happens to students who have an interaction with a school resource officer that is formal enough to classify as an incident. That's something that board members have been asking for since I arrived, and I want to thank Sergeant Blonick in particular for helping us put that together with a level of accuracy that we have uh, not been able to pull uh, together in the previous two times I've done this. Um, of course, we have to maintain student confidentiality, and in a couple cases, uh, given that the the systems involved here are large and complex. There are a couple of students, really a handful, whose uh, uh, outcomes uh, are not something that we were able to discern immediately through our data sets. But you'll see we were able to pull together data on almost every student who had a formal interaction with a school resource officer this past year. I want to start out, uh, and this is not in the PowerPoint, by saying that we have received no complaints about the uh, performance or behavior of any individual school resource officer from any parent, student, or staff member in Rochester Public Schools over the past year. And we checked our formal records to be sure that I was not just saying that based on the fact that I usually hear all the complaints. Um, but that was something that obviously is, uh, is a relevant data point as well. So um, board members know that as the board led the redesign of our contract, they built in a series of expectations for uh, school resource officer engagement in the life of our schools, uh, and in particular with kids in communities that, uh, whose experiences with law enforcement may not necessarily lead them to uh, form those close connections and positive relationships with school resource officers. So you can see there that the, uh, the goals for our SROs have been daily to be checking in with the administration and support teams to always be visible 
in hallways, cafeteria, um, and then finding uh, informal ways to connect with students, staff, parents, caregivers on an ongoing basis. Somewhat more formally, the goal has been weekly to be meeting with equity specialists, social workers, counselors, those people who are involved in those critical support uh, roles in our schools and who often, frankly, are among the first to know when a student is struggling, um, to have SROs working with our student groups um, and then also doing edu educational uh, presentations for our students. I think the board has gotten to know Officer Alzola, who could really take his show on the road in terms of his uh, ability to uh, engage students in uh, presentations, but it's not uh, limited to him and our other uh, resource officers are engaged in that as well. Monthly, we uh, have the goal of uh, SROs being involved in safety preparedness and plans and review protocols. Of course, they're also involved in our safety uh, drills and I was just uh, chatting with Sergeant Blahnik that the driver's ed work uh, is a hugely positive but also hugely time consuming uh, uh, piece of this kind of engagement. With our, um, with our students for the, for the resource officers. And then uh, situations as needed, bringing SROs involved in addressing uh, safeties. Our SROs are focused on our middle schools and our high schools, but they do get involved with elementary schools as needed. They go in to speak in classrooms. They've been involved in other presentations. Uh, the threat assessment process that we conduct, which is essentially a way of assessing a specific potential threat, whether it's from inside or outside our schools, uh, intensively involves um, SROs. We've also had uh, home visits and uh, SROs beginning to be involved in our restorative practice work in our schools. And then uh, summer camp, which uh, I had a lot of fun uh, meeting with students last year in the inaugural version of the summer camp that RPD ran for students who might be maybe one day interested in law enforcement or at minimum are getting a great leadership development experience in that, um, in, in that summer camp experience. Um, across all of those activities, I'm uh, very confident to report to the board that we have maintained the very clear line that we've uh, drawn with board leadership between school discipline and events that potentially threaten the safety of students or staff or involve illegal activity. SROs in Rochester Public Schools do not do school discipline full stop. And we have really got that, I think, quite clear after a couple years of intensive work on it. Um, I've seen videos in which a student is being disciplined, including one who gets into physical altercations, which are few and far between, but do happen. And you can see on a video that the school resource officer remains distant and removed from the entire activity and doesn't engage um, unless and until there is actually a physical threat to safety and literally remains on the perimeter and comes in in a way that is very carefully structured and that our leadership teams have really worked hard with uh, with our SROs. Should board members want more specific data on these activities, either uh, yet this year or um, in future years, we'd be glad to pursue that, but I wanted to, again, in the interest of brevity, give you an overview uh, of where we have been. So now we turn to really the debut of some data that I uh, think needs to become an annual part of this process. Um, whatever decisions the board is making on uh, the, the contract with Rochester, City of Rochester. And that's to look at what happens when a student has an engagement with a resource officer that is more than one of those informal conversations in the hallway or more than one of those classroom presentations. It's such that uh, RPD logs it in their records and we, uh, as appropriate, log it in our records. And one of the questions that the board members have asked is what's happening to these kids? Are these kids ending up getting ticketed, are they ending up in detention centers? Are we actually putting them in what has colloquially sometimes been called the school to prison pipeline? And so the data that you're gonna see here has been uh, pulled together and it talks about a, a kind of a cascading set of outcomes. A citation, a ticket, is a formal notice that's given for those minor infractions and it indicates the offense and potential consequences. Um, and uh, courts can impose a fine, uh, refer to three, rivers, three rivers, rivers restorative justice or uh, diversion. And if board members want to get uh, deeper into that, I'm sure Sergeant Polonik can talk about those options. Uh, three Rivers Restorative Justice is an organization uh, here in Rochester that has become an indispensable partner both for Rochester Police Department and for us in taking a positive approach to students whose behavior um, potentially or in actuality crosses the line of legality, but for whom we do not want to get them engaged in the juvenile justice system. 
Diversion, similarly, actually entails redirecting students away from the traditional court processes um, and into uh, community-based intervention or other re, uh, rehabilitation. And then finally, no action means that law enforcement chose not to pursue any action after there was an investigation of the incident. Now, this is the craziest minuscule font ever, and I apologize. For, for, for board members and for the public, there's a PDF of this that is not in that slide that you can get on our assembly website. And um, you can also, if you squint, look in at this, at this slide. Um, I wanna, again, thank the team up here for working very hard to pull this data together with um, greater accuracy and precision than we have done in, in previous years. And we're gonna get better and better at this going forward. But to briefly just highlight three examples of how board members <laughs> could read this chart. Just to take the first line, obviously, accidents or accidents or injury is defined as an unintentional collision or mishap. So if you go along, you can see we had 17 reports in our high schools or last year of an accident that meets that criteria. Um, one in a middle school and zero in elementary and zero at our um, uh, alternative learning center. So we have a total of 18 cases. And in that instance, RPD reported they took no action on those 18 cases of accidents insofar as there was any involvement with juvenile justice system, ticketing, Three Rivers. The police <coughs> assisted, as of course they often do, with addressing the accident. If you go down to one that is a little more complex, assault, which is uh, four, layer, four rows down, which is defined as a physical attack or, and this can be very important, the threat of harm that might not actually involve a physical altercation. You can see there were six that were reported in our high schools, six in our middle schools, none in our elementaries, uh, one in the, our alternative learning center, and so we have a total of 13 that were reported. Four, no action was taken beyond that. Three were given a citation, a ticket. And then when we talk about those students who got a citation, two of those remain open. These are recent instances, remain ongoing. One is uh, under court jurisdiction. Um, and then four were referred to Three, River, Three Rivers Restorative Justice for the kind of community engaged and rehabilitative um, uh, exercises that uh, are the hallmark of what they do with young people and two of those are actually in court at present. I'll give one other example just to kind of help read the, uh, the, the minuscule font and the chart since it may become something board members wanna talk about tonight or monitor on an ongoing basis. Parking violation, we had four of those uh, in our high schools. No middle school or elementary school kids were parking in the wrong places, <laughs> um, and so, which is good. Um, we ha so we had four incidents that were reported, two had no action, and two got tickets. And so that is a good way. There are a couple cases where we found where we say not licensed in MGA, and that is, as I'm sure Sergeant Blonick can describe, a, a, a data source that we were not immediately able to identify the specific outcomes for those students, but as you can see, that's relatively uh, infrequent. So board members, if I had to take a step back from this, I think it is fair to say that um, the total number of students who are being involved in any incident with uh, SROs, given that we serve about 17,500, is low. And that of those students who are involved in an incident that involves an SRO, the vast majority are resulting in no action, restorative justice, or some type of action that does not take them into the juvenile justice system in a formal way which of course is entirely our and Rochester Police Department's uh, intent. So um, as I said at the outset, the school resource officer uh, contract would automatically renew unless either party provides that written notice. Um, as board members will recall in previous years where board members felt they needed more time to look at this issue, we've requested and uh, Rochester Police Department has agreed to an extension of that deadline. We are bringing this to you tonight in prep for action and it's on the agenda uh, for your next meeting for action that would allow us to meet that timeline. Um, uh, but again, the need for more time and consideration of this issue would be up to the board. So 
With that, uh, Madam Chair, I will <coughs> turn it back. I envision that uh, from this point forward, uh, any discussion board members want to have will be much more with these three folks who live this work every day. But I wanted to give that high-level overview of what we've seen in the work of our school resource officers thus far this year. Board members, any questions or comments? Director Marvin. I just want to say thank you for the, uh, for the glossary that you provided. It, it makes it much easier to understand what these incidents are exactly, and so that you and we have the same understanding about what, for instance, does um, Project Lifesaver mean. So thanks for that. Director McLaughlin. Um, actually, a question for um, Mr. Lindgren. Would it, as I listened to um, Dr. Marvin talk about that, are these reflected then in our student handbook, or is this something we want to maybe further incorporate or modify what's in our handbook to better match these so that students, parents, everyone are on the same page with these very helpful definitions? Well, the, these definitions would be more of the, on the police side than what we would do. Um, we, we'd have like um, assaults and harassments and those things, but we don't use the word escort as far as when they're helping somebody or missing person type of thing. Um, but we could match it as close as we needed to. Okay, there we go. Um, but yeah, we do have some, some of these with, within it. Um, I think I'm answering that question, but is it is that what you're looking at, or are you looking at the data more? Um, I think it's more the definitions that okay. are there cross-references or similar definitions in our handbook that perhaps need yes. to be updated okay. so that we're on the same page. Sorry. Yes, we do have some of those things there. As, as I was answering, I'm like, wait, I'm not answering that question. Do you feel like these definitions already match, or are there some updates that need to be made? I'm um, certainly there could be some within the updates of what of how the police use it to create a right. And recognizing that this list is probably longer than much longer, uh, much longer yeah. but still relevant to this discussion, yeah. but there might be some that would be helpful for the handbook. Um, and then I also wanted to point out just one technical thing about the presentation that um, that data slide. When I'm looking at that on my iPad it cuts off at the parking violations. Um, oh. So if someone is wanting to look at the very nitty gritty detail of that chart, we may want to print it, they may want to print it out um, so that they get the full information. And there also is a, a PDF of just that data that's in the in assembly as well, because um, I know that that is a- That might be where I looked very at Very unreasonable <laughs> slide. We'll, we'll work on the graphics, thank you. Director Garcia. Mine was more of a, like a comment slash question to you when you were saying that you had not received um, feedback, essentially, or like negative feedback. I recall sending you a, a screenshot of a message that I got on social media about the presentation. Can you just speak to how students and their families are notified when an officer is going to be doing a presentation in the classroom and what that content is about and how they are able to opt in or out of that process? Uh, thank you, Dr. Garcia. What I was referring to, we haven't received a formal complaint. Um, so when someone files a formal complaint about one of those, um, the presentations that our SROs do, um, when it involves a subject that might be sensitive for parental reasons, we do ask our schools to let parents uh, know and other caregivers so that they have an opportunity should they choose. That applies across the curriculum, of course, not just with SRO. Um, I will tell you, I think, um, Dr. Garcia, that is a process that going into next year, again, not just regarding SRO presentations, I think we need to revisit and tighten up. And so I think uh, it certainly is the expectation. I think we can get better and better at that so that a, a, a parent or caregiver might have the, uh, the appropriate lead time to decide that a presentation might not be something that they want their student to participate in. Um, but we certainly do have that expectation, and when I'm very confident that when a parent makes a request not to have their student attend a presentation, that our schools comply. As your question suggests, the question is, do they know sure. um, with sufficient advance warning? And so that's something that uh, we've had recent reason to think about wanting to make sure we have good processes in place. Um, and that we're not leaving it to, you know, a teacher, counselor, social worker who's got a zillion other things on their plate to proactively think, okay, how... I've got a SRO coming in to do a presentation or I've got a com community agency coming in. H how do I let parents know the subject of that early enough to make a decision? Sure. So I, I would welcome the, the chance to come back to you with that, um, uh, with an update on how we can tighten that process. 
Director McLaughlin. I was struggling earlier to read my own handwriting, so I apologize. Um, I think this is really, really helpful. I guess the one question I have of being someone on the board who has really looked at this issue previously is can we commit to using the same data analysis moving forward? It seemed like that was one of the struggles prior years as we kept getting different data every year. And if we know that this is going to be workable, continuing with this so that we can compare year over year data. Well, I, I agree, Director McLaughlin, and that's critical. I mean, Sergeant Blonick, if you want to comment on from the RPD side, this is data you are all collecting, and I think to your point, it's really about making sure we have tight definitions and that we have both officers and our staff recording these incidents accurately and as closely as we can. I don't see a reason why we couldn't commit to, to provide the board with this right. same data every year, do you? No, and we've collaboratively worked together on this, and I think the last couple months here, just sitting down and having conversations on what you're looking for and what you need, we can definitely provide that. We awesome. take a little bit of time to put together, but we will definitely. I will say Sergeant Blonick sends me every month um, the updated data. And then at the end of the year where we're at right now is where he had collaborated with records and, <coughs> and the people he needed to to come up with the results that we have. But we do get every month what the data looks like. That's great to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have one comment just on the contract. Do we want to talk about that now or? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I appreciate there is nowhere near the level of angst and anxiety about talking about this contract this time around than it has been previously. Um, I did have one comment that I actually previewed with Sergeant Blonick over the break, is that there is a provision in the contract for when they hire a new officer that someone from the district is on the hiring panel. And I know Superintendent Piquel, I think I mentioned this to you previously, I would really advocate for a school board member to be on that panel as well. We'll need some advance notice, um, but I, th I think that that's one thing that um, a board member can attend, observe, see the candidates, understand what the process is for selecting candidates, and then report back to the board. Um, what I told um, Sergeant Blonick in the back during the break is that the big focus for me is to make sure that we're having officers in our school who are confident and comfortable working with our students. Um, that I think that firsthand experience in an interview process would help ensure um, at least for me as a board member, that we're picking the right people to play that very important role in our schools. If, if I can ask, uh, Dr. McLaughlin, would you, would you like us to include that as a proposed change in the contract, meaning specifically board members there, or just to pursue that with RPD through our leadership channels? Because I think it's a very, from my perspective, and I am not the police department, uh, a very, very doable uh, thing. We don't know if we'll have any transitions of SROs, but, you know, they tend to have kids and take jobs and life happens. So um, it, we could pursue it through the contract or we could just take that as, I think, a board uh, direction that we'll try and work out collaboratively. Is there? I think it could be um, collaboratively. I actually was surprised that that wasn't in the contract already. It identifies uh, district personnel mm -hmm. um, that I would encourage us to think about that broadly and include the school board in that, okay. in that definition. I don't think it necessarily needs to be modified in the contract now. If we want to in the future, that could be a future consideration. Yeah, I, I can commit to take that up with RPD leadership for sure and report back on how we think that would happen. And if, I understand that right now it wouldn't involve the change in the contract, but should we, should we find over the next year that that is not a process that we can make happen, we could, the board could reconsider in future years actually putting it in the contract. And I guess I look at it that if it's it's school personnel, I think that's our choice to decide who's, you know, we send one person, do we send more than one? I think we get to have some ownership of what that is and what the expectation is. Great, thank you. Director Garcia. I would say to pick up, I guess, or maybe piggyback on that, not necessarily specific to the contract, but like when we're talking about no action being taken because we're diverting some other way, having those processes laid out somewhere else. Because I think the thing that often is missing in these um, presentations, like I do appreciate the, the adjustment in data and like making it clearer, but what are the safeguards that we also are putting in place, like the administration and the school board to ensure that if this is going to happen, it's in the way that we want it to occur. So when we have things like we're asking a school board or some other personnel member to be a part of the board, like what does that process look like? When we're choosing to divert what 
are the roles of each agency in that and how, you know, what does that look like sort of thing so that we can mm -hmm. show, like, I mean, to me, it's a significant, and some of the numbers, like, if you have something that's, you know, there were 38 incidents and 26 of them re resulted in no action, to me, that means we did nothing when I get that that means we actually did something else mm -hmm. um, rather than getting the kid in trouble and putting them in the criminal justice system. Like, because then we then would become data for all of the, um, or maybe like a response to if SRO, you know, if the studies now show that SROs in schools increase the likelihood that students would, um, you know, increase their access to the school to confinement pipeline, if this is showing like we're doing something different here, how do we articulate that and bring it out in the data to justify their existence in our schools? Yeah, I, th I think it's an excellent point. It's a little bit similar to what uh, Mr. Ruffin was making about the Youth Truth Survey. Like, you can have the data, but do you articulate your process for acting on the data? And I think this is a this has been a quantum leap for us this year with the data. And I think you're right. We ought to have some flowcharts. We ought to have some right. definitions that describe some like meta, diversion. yeah, like a meta analysis of like these are all of the things that were asked for basically since 2020, and this is what we did or didn't do and why. I mean, it's almost like kind of like our APEC letter, like we're responding to the thing that they're telling us we're not doing it, like how are we doing that in the district, I think would be helpful. So not so much comment to them, but us, you know, and the way that we do that work. Director Barlow? Um, I believe two quick things. Um, this current legislative session, um, SROs were discussed quite extensively. Uh, were there any decisions made um, that affected or impacted um, what RPD SROs do. Um, I'm thinking of the uh, training uh, requirement uh, that uh, I think that was passed. I might be mistaken. At least considered. I think it's still, yeah, it's still, I think it's still in the House. Okay. I think, do you envision that potentially having any direct impact? Yeah, it's, it's interesting you bring that up. So we plan in August, um, Homeland Security through state schools are going to be coming down and we're networking with them and actually we're going to put on a school resource officer training to kind of mitigate some of those questions that you're thinking or are talking about there and we will address those. But yeah, we, we strive on making sure that all the SROs have all the proper training that they need and actually we go above and beyond. There's actually two of them right now that have the advanced training. Uh, but we are going to continue to network with our partners and have host training and so forth because we like to be the leader in that. So. And then, um, oh, uh, my goodness, I'll move to the next thing. Uh, so I noticed, and, and this is clearly to allow us um, to consider the current um, uh, contractual arrangement we have with RPD. Um, the separation between district discipline data, uh, they used to be kind of together, or we would, well, these were referred to RPD, and, and, and this is a response where I think what we've asked, well, what happened, what came of that? So will we still have, if you will, discipline data presented, okay? Uh, you will, Director Bala, we'll have a whole deep dive into it this summer. We intentionally decoupled it insofar as um, discipline data is separate from engagement. Sure. Sure. I will tell you that in putting this together, everything that is cataloged here in RPD data is in our data as um, either something that was an investigation or that there was some action and it would code that the SRO was involved but we haven't brought the discipline data to you tonight with the logic of it being separate from the SROs, but we are, our data systems are talking to each other better than uh, they have previously, for sure, I think. And I was probably unclear, uh, I meant more so uh, referrals mm -hmm. uh, to RPD. Uh, and uh, so thank you for that. And I'm still trying to figure out that last time. Mm -hmm. Just a reminder, not every one of these is a referral that we have given. Okay. So an example is that the animal, or whatever. Um, we that doesn't go into our discipline referral. There's not an animal that's going to get a referral mm -hmm. for us or whatever. So it's not, not every one of these is a di discipline mm -hmm. referral, but ours are inside of that. Yes. Is that kind of what you were going with with that question too? 
Uh, yes. I mean, given the time, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough. Well, and I, I think it is an important point that a few people have made um, because a number of these categories do appear in our student handbook as level two offenses. So just because there may not have been an action by um, a diversion or a citation doesn't mean that through our student handbook procedures, we didn't take action on that behavior. And that, I think, is what we're going to see when we see the discipline data. Will there be a way to remind us of the, of the data that we're going to get in the discipline data? Some sort of tracker of total number of referrals in this category. These were also cross-referenced as an SRO um, encounter referral contact. Let me commit to take a look at that. Okay. It's not as simplistic, simple as it might seem, given that once a student is actually in this process, in many cases in pulling this together, we didn't know who this kid was that was getting restored to, placed to Three Rivers or cited or whatever. We don't get the individual, uh, Billy got this consequence in the justice system but we got it in the aggregate. So they didn't tell us the name, but we got it in the aggregate here. So we would need to be able to marry the two, because um, we do know who all the kids are in our discipline system. And we know who all these kids are who had a, an interaction with an SRO, but it's the consequences that's the breakthrough with this data that we're beginning to see now. So I, I hear what you're asking for. I don't immediately see why we couldn't do that, but I don't want to commit to do it if it proves to be a little more uh, complex than I'm thinking it would be. But isn't that the tension of this? I think when you're asking about like us decoupling discipline data and what is illegal activity and actionable by law enforcement, that's essentially what we're looking for. Like we hope that SROs do such a good job in our schools that they're working themselves out of a job. Like they've managed crime in the area that they don't need to be there anymore, right? And so when does it, like when do our data numbers hit so low that we don't need that? Now we're focused simply on disciplinary issues that are not necessarily illegal, but things that kids are doing that are disruptive to the learning environment, mm -hmm. right? And so it it's difficult, but I feel like that's kind of the drain we've been circling f for four years almost now. Like how do we how do we articulate that and at, and who is responsible? I mean we're all responsible, but like who is responsible in each of those moments? And when do we need to shift roles? Like when do we overlap and when, when is it theirs versus our responsibility to, to follow up on whatever the consequence is or the outcome of that? I, I absolutely hear what you're asking about. I, th this was harder than I anticipated it would be and so I don't want to overpromise. But I totally understand. <laughs> you don't have to do what, it in the same format. Yeah, we can make <laughs> bigger font. Yeah. But no, it, but I totally understand yeah. what you're both asking for and we will take this as we, I think we're in June for the discipline uh, data or July. So we will absolutely, um, we will find the, the most accurate ways we can to connect the dots between these data and our discipline data um, when, we, when we bring that to you. I, I just wanted to uh, quickly add my voice to that of others that I think that this format for reporting the information is a helpful feedback mechanism for the board. So um, I would encourage um, the collaboration that was involved in pulling that information together to continue. Um, and also, from my perspective, the, uh, um, the information that's presented is helpful not because I have an interest in kids avoiding accountability. I think that that is how you honor um, a, a culture of high achievement and high standards um, is by providing that accountability. I think we do that, and we do that um, very well and very conscientiously um, in ways that avoid legal justice outcomes that do more harm than good in terms of bringing about the full potential of each one of our students and keeping in mind the adults that they're going to grow into. Um, and so I, I, I think that this is a really helpful format for us. Um, I also really value the role that our SROs play in incident response and threat assessment. Um, and uh, I guess the, my last observation is I think that this contract might be the only one that we've looked at this year with only a 2% cost escalator. Um, so 
That's kind of nice. <laughs> 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 Don't let it else know. Anything else, board members? I just wanted to add, uh, because I don't think I artic articulated it very well earlier. I love the fact that the discipline data and the, the SRO data is separate. Yes. But I think that that's been a major goal since we started looking at this issue and having those very clearly separated out in our data and in our thinking and in our implementation is a primary goal of why we work so hard on this. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Moving on to our next prep for action item, which is the school board response to APAC. Um, the board is scheduled to take action on this agenda item at the April 23rd meeting. Superintendent Pickell. Thank you, Chair Nathan and board members. Uh, our executive director of equity and engagement, uh, Will Ruffin, is uh, coming up. Um, the purpose of this session um, uh, tonight is simply to, to find out if there are um, themes, points, issues in the draft uh, response to our American Indian, uh, Indian Parent Advisory Committee that board members would like us to work on between now and when you would be voting on this response in your next meeting. I will say that the study session, the discussion that we had um, and your last meeting was invaluable to us. I want to thank Will and also, of course, Amelia Cordell um, and Tucker Quito and our American Indian liaisons for putting together the draft that you have. Um, and so, uh, Madam Chair, we really stand ready to take any board feedback or suggestions into our vision that we will prepare for your consideration at your next meeting. Board members, any comments, edits, markups? Dr. Garcia. Um, I just had one. I think the letter, uh, thank you for this, um, generally reflects my sentiment and what I heard in our study session. The one sentence, and then maybe this is just personal preference, so feel free to provide <laughs> your response, is that it says, we firmly believe that RPS and APAC can embark on this journey of healing by maintaining close collaborations with members of APAC to guide our efforts. The word healing feels a little bit like white savior to me. And so maybe there's another way that we can phrase our intention that we firmly believe that we can collaborate or work in this space together and maintain those collaborations without suggesting that like we're coming in and doing the work. Um, but I would be also interested to hear like, and maybe we don't, there's not time for this, but like APAC's response to that. Because obviously we're saying that the two of us together, and perhaps this is a word that they would want to use for this, um, but just on first read that felt a little bit like to me and that's really my only sort of like editorial comment we'd be glad to take a look at that term and we can talk uh, also with Tucker and Amelia but I, I said will and I agreed they did not need to be here uh, tonight just to yeah. get this we'll pass on that feedback and have a dialogue mm -hmm. with them I appreciate that any other comments board members okay thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thanks for all your work, for listening. Good job, Mr. Ruffin. All right, our next is an action item, the RPS online name change. This is an action item, but before we talk about the resolution, I understand there is a presentation well, and a reveal. Uh, there, there is a presentation and a reveal, and I'm looking to make sure that I have, a ban Brandon McCraffick, our uh, wonderful RPS online uh, principal is coming up. Um, as board members will, will recall, one of the first recommendations I made to this board was to create <coughs> the secondary program at RPS Online very shortly uh, after I got to Rochester. And um, Brandon has picked up that mantle with the amazing team at RPS Online and really nurtured and grown a very innovative program, especially at the middle high school level, which didn't exist at all, but we've continued to offer services to our younger learners. As I have been more and more excited about what we're offering in Rochester, I started to get this feeling in the back of my head that does RPS online even mean anything to anybody outside Rochester or maybe even in Rochester? And if we've got a good, I hate to use this terminology, but product, we ought to market it. Um, and so that prompted a discussion with uh, Brandon and then he and his 
the school community have taken it and run with it, and that brings us to tonight. That it does. So thank you for uh, inviting me tonight to, to share this information with you. Um, do we have the, oh, well, look at that. <laughs> right. I think the last time I was here I said, you would think that the principal of the online school would understand. <laughs> so, right? History repeats itself. So I'm happy to be here tonight to share with you um, a little bit about the, the why that Dr. Pacella shared, um, our process, and uh, the group of um, stakeholders that were engaged in, in this decision, and a little bit of the feedback that we got from our stakeholders on the name that we are bringing to you tonight, and then the reveal of that recommendation. So um, just to repeat a little bit of what Dr. Pacella said, um, we are looking to engage in a more comprehensive and statewide marketing effort to raise awareness of our learning environment and um, to increase our enrollment in, in this K-12 learning community. And uh, again, while RPS Online uh, has a minimum level of meaning in our geographic area, it just simply does not carry the same weight uh, or meaning statewide. Um, for instance, if you are in the Twin Cities, RPS could be Richfield Public Schools, Robbinsdale Public Schools, um, probably six or seven other RPSs. And, you know, finishing our third year um, as a comprehensive online learning community, we know better now about who we are and, and what we aim to provide to our, to our students and families. Um, and so um, we believe that that process of achieving our goal of becoming the best online learning community in the state begins with a new name. And I do want to point out that we are going to maintain the Chargers um, mascot name and logo. We put too much time and effort <laughs> into coming up with that last year um, to, to change that. So timeline of our process, and I promise I'm, I'm going to make this quicker than it may seem. But um, as Dr. Pakel said, this started with a conversation in December with, um, between the two of us and, and Director Peterson. And then I took back to our site uh, continuous improvement team a proposed timeline and process for, um, for this decision. In January, we convened an eight-person steering committee, and I'll share with you the members of that on the next slide. And we established a preliminary list of school names and descriptors. So I want to be clear on that. School name would be like um, John Marshall. Descriptor would be high school, right? Um, so we came up with those separately proposed school names, proposed descriptors. During the month of February, we gathered stakeholder feedback um, on those preliminary school names and descriptors, both ranking and narrative from students, staff, and families that are aligned with um, RPS Online. And then in March, that steering committee came back together and reached consensus on a final school name recommendation. And here's just a quick overview of who served on that steering committee. I thought it was appropriate listening to uh, uh, Will Ruffin and, and uh, Sarah Louise's presentation. Um, two of our most active members on our steering committee were our two students, um, Lily and Joseph, who are on our, our student council. And I do want to give a shout out to Christine, who is uh, the, the lone member of our steering committee who, who stuck it out tonight and, uh, and came to be a part of the presentation. So we had staff, parents, students, and then a member of our communications team who helped us navigate this. Um, before I get to the big reveal, I just want to share with you some of the narrative feedback that we got on this name that we're bringing to you tonight. So um, somebody liked the idea of using MN in the name. So this is the, a little bit of the tease. Um, <laughs> another, another stakeholder felt this really encompassed both the format and location, but they also felt it was trendy. Um, Liked the idea of the name, gives a clear representation of what the school is. I preferred this one the most. It's state specific, specific, kind of sounds like you're syncing or bringing the students around the state together. Ties in with every aspect of our school, the best option by far. Um, it's concise and has clarity. The sync aspect also underscores inclusion and cohesion. I was really impressed with how much our stakeholders read into the names and gave us feedback that even we as a steering committee had not, um, had not really thought of or discussed. Best option, it's catchy, rolls off the tongue easily, and comes with purpose and meaning. 
I love it. It's a more clear explanation of what the school is, synchronous first learning. So without further ado, we're thrilled to bring before you our unanimous recommendation for our new school name, which is MinSync Online, brought to you by Rochester Public Schools. <laughs> Any of you that are fans of 90s boy Yes. Bands? <laughs> the millennial in me laughed when I saw that. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Sorry, I won't do it. Oh, <laughs> had that one queued up, didn't you? Yeah, had that queued up. Yeah, I that ready. Um, board members, any discussion before I read the resolution? <coughs> All right. Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 approves the name change from RPS Online to MinSync Online. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Any additional discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution has been approved. Congratulations. Thank you very Congratulations. much. I, I would just uh, add, Madam Chair, and, and thank you again for this work. I mean, it, this is fun, but this, is, this stuff's really important. I mean, mm -hmm. I've talked to people who have said uh, there's no doubt Google would not be Google had they not found the name Google which was this brilliant, like, you know, thing. And I mean, I think uh, when, when I first heard this, of course I did think of NSYNC and whatever, but actually, I, that's not bad. And like, I think that um, this is, and we have to support you in the larger outreach and marketing, as in fact, we need to do a better job with all of our schools in helping them um, really uh, convey what makes them unique. And you have a unique opportunity because you can be anywhere and yeah. be in our, uh, and, and not an RPS online, a MinSync online student. And, and I think the synchronous first focus is really one that we have to continue to highlight because there are so many versions of what online learning looks like. And sometimes it is a recorded teacher who recorded it three months ago and there is no human interaction. But the model that you've developed, the, the human connection through the virtual space has been your priority and I think that's what we've heard from a lot of our students and our families that that's the piece that they value um, so much from what you've put together so and we continue to hear it um, from our any any student or parent that fills out our intake form um, they're excited about that synchronous option mm -hmm. right. Dr. Cook so the the trademark attorney and me can't <laughs> help but um, just <clears throat> um, elaborate briefly the Association with the unique capabilities of the MinSync um, online learning opportunity is is helpful because of the distinctive brand. But it's a brand is only ever as good as the product that it is associated with and that it is meant to um, uh, draw associations with in the people that you're trying to communicate with. Um, so it's a it's a good brand. It's distinctive. Um, I hope actually that it is not something that uh, creates allusions to uh, pop stars, but um, lean into the, the synchronous offering and how that's a distinctive feature of our um, unique capabilities in Rochester. I think it's great. And, it's, and the reason it's great is because of the unique learning um, opportunities that we have in RPS um, that you've done such a great job of, of leading and creating that community around. So love it. Thanks. So if I, if I can just respond to that, our steering committee did have conversations specifically about in, down the road when someone searches for online schools in Minnesota, that's why they wanted to have the MN in there mm -hmm. um, and then the synchronous and writing a really good Google profile so that when MinSync Online comes up, it speaks to exactly what you're, you're talking about, where it shares the unique features and, and supports and opportunities that that our school provides to students across the state. Dr. McLaughlin. Um, kind of a practical question, but also personal to me because I have to give the update after the meeting. <laughs> Is it okay to talk about this in the update, ready to roll out? What's the time frame? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, yes. <laughs> um, our staff knows they, they were kind of given a little bit of a gag order until tonight um, just because we, we wanted but I believe there's a, a press release that, that will go out um, in the morning. I worked with Michael on that today. So 
yeah, as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, unless Dr. Pickell has any objections, it's certainly true. And we've no, I'm sure there's tonight. five reporters here because of this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. There we go. Every one of these reporters the is here for here. MinSync they online. Couldn't yeah. They couldn't wait. Yeah, I just think I got a big charge out of this, so thank you. Oh. <laughs> and given that, board members, thank you and congratulations. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. So our next agenda item is also an action item, the Rethinking Funding Guiding Principles. Uh, the board discussed this recommendation at the March 19th meeting. I'll read the resolution, ask for a motion and second, and if received, we can open the floor for discussion. Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby approve the Rethinking Funding Guiding Principles as outlined in the background of this agenda item. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Do you have any additional information? No, I just want to thank the board. There was a significant revision of this from the first draft to this one. Uh, it's clearer as a result of, in particular, the division of it into three core components of the funding strategy and then descriptors of how we want the system to work. So it's actually, uh, I think, a, a, a more user-friendly set of principles that we will be using over the next six months, uh, well, somewhat more than six months, to bring you a recommendation by December. Hearing no other discussions, all those in favor of the resolution say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution has been approved. The next item is Pinewood conversion to an early learning school. This is also an action item that was discussed at the March 19th meeting. I will read the resolution, ask for a motion and second, and if received, we'll open the floor for discussion. Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby approve relocation of Mighty Oaks learning, Early Learning School to Pinewood Elementary School. And be it further resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 535 does hereby approve a maximum construction budget of up to $2.1 million to be funded by approximately $1.4 million of operating capital reserves, $0.5 million of general fund, and $0.2 million of community education fund. Move approval. Second. It has been moved and seconded. <clears throat> Any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The resolution has been approved. Our next agenda item is 8.1, our annual board calendar draft updated. The current version is available in the agenda for reference for uh, our future uh, school board meetings. Are there any agenda items board members would like to raise for consideration for a future meeting agenda? Director Barlow. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, out of consideration of policy 208, development, adoption, and implement, implementation of policies, I'd like to have um, the RPS Administrative Guideline for Supporting Transgender and Gender Expansive Students move to um, policy. Uh, if I may briefly comment within that guideline, the superintendent did indicate that uh, the guideline was only in effect up until the time the board developed the policy and also referenced that that would probably occur during the 23-24 school year, of which we are uh, rapidly moving towards an end. So. Okay. Um, I can give you an update on that. Um, we have been in contact with MSBA regarding um, that guideline, which is originally based on MSBA model guidelines. And because of um, changes in the Minnesota legislature that happened last session and this session, as well as waiting for some Title IX uh, updates from the federal government, they are going to be updating the model guidance on which our guidance is based. So we were waiting to bring that back to the policy committee for consideration as a procedure. Um, it, would, it would be amended to one of our current policy as a procedure until we got those updates from MSBA. Okay. So the, the question is if we, if we take it to the policy committee mm -hmm. in its current format, we could take it to the policy committee, policy committee could recommend it to the board, but it's most likely there will be significant revisions coming from MSBA in the next few months that we would then have to update again. So the question is how quickly, if at all, we take action. Mm -hmm. Well, um, <clears throat> if I may, Madam Chair, 
Um, I don't think we necessarily run afoul of an administrative guideline. Uh, I think so, Dr. Pickell, and I, I don't want to speak for you, but you had, uh, I won't say purposely, but within the guideline you had referenced that the board would, uh, and, and that it would occur during this uh, current school year. Uh, does that then suggest if uh, the model policy isn't released within this current school year. Will you then reissue the guideline, or is it only in effect? I, I guess I wonder how does that affect the guideline if it was tied to language that was specific to policy development within the current school year? Uh, thank you, Director Waller. The guidelines, uh, as Chair Nathan said, we're not only based, uh, largely though not entirely, on school boards association, they also were based on extensive input from our legal counsel. And they adhere very closely to established legal precedent. That said, the legal environment around some of these issues is fluid and changing. So when the initial guideline was written, we had anticipated that, uh, in particular, uh, some upcoming federal guidance on Title IX and revised um, state statute would have been finished by now. And so I was never entirely sure what the policy committee would choose to recommend to the board, but always did believe we should take it up. And that's always been the intent. The, the, the hope was to take it up, as Chair Nathan said, when we have the most recent um, updated guidance from our school boards association. And then, uh, as I mentioned, we also got guidance from our legal counsel uh, in their interpretation of current relevant uh, laws. We certainly could refer it in advance of that guidance for the policy committee to engage in that discussion. I would have some concern about making recommendation to the board if we thought that there was likely to be significant uh, shift in the guidance that we're adhering to. I also know that Rochester uh, School Board can and should do what you think is best for Rochester students. So should you want to put a process into motion, it might mean uh, an additional revision once we have uh, additional insight. Um, I think that the way the administrative guidance is written is quite intentionally administrative guidance. It's neither procedure nor policy. Because when I issued that, I give administrative guidance to our administrators uh, about a lot of things, from testing to um, discipline to school resource officers. And in this instance, the administrative guidance seemed important, and I think it has been largely very constructively received. Um, but as you know, Director Barlow, I've always thought that ultimately this is something that the school board should take up at such time as we have the best understanding of the legal requirements. One of the largest, I think, among some folks who have not understood the guidance I issued one of the largest sources of misunderstanding, and frankly, which I was quite surprised to learn about as I engaged in a pretty intensive study, is that this is established law. We are not freelancing. Um, we are dealing with established law that has been uh, well supported in litigation, um, and that we are, of course, obliged to adhere to. There are, of course, other areas in which school boards uh, can make decisions within the parameters of law. So that was the logic of waiting until updated M MSBA guidance uh, and updated uh, advice, in particular on some Title IX issues from our attorneys. But we'd be pleased to support the board policy committee in looking at this at whatever time frame uh, you decided was advisable. And it would be, that's a long-winded way of finally getting, and until that happens, the, the guidance is in force. So I can promise from a policy committee standpoint, because we are starting to look at scheduling the rest of our meetings for the year, um, to schedule the meeting and we'll put it on the agenda. And at that time, we'll know what our current status is with receiving more information from MSBA, um, what the Title IX information is that's coming from the feds. And um, we could have a conversation in policy committee with a superintendent of how the guidance might convert to procedure because as the superintendent said, the way it's written doesn't necessarily follow our structure for procedures. So we could always get it into place in a structure that would be ready to either bring to the board or then decide to wait for further updates. Thank you. Thank you. Any other feedback on that? All right. 
Um, I actually do have a little bit of yep. um, Would you envision that it, it seemed to strike me that if we could get this accomplished before the beginning of the next school year, um, to have it in place for a new school year starting, I think that would be an ideal time frame if we can meet that time frame, recognizing we have to wait for some others, but could we at least get the procedure in place prior to that time frame? I think that's MSBA's hope as well, that they'll that they'll be able to have that information on that timeline. And then so us being goal. able to incorporate and vote yes. prior to the yes. school year. Awesome, thank you. All right. All right, our next item is other business, board questions and responses. Um, any questions submitted by board members on tonight's meeting agenda items are available in this agenda item. We have three upcoming board meetings uh, two upcoming board meetings in April. April 16th is a study session, and April 23rd is a regular meeting. Both begin at 5.30 p.m. And hearing no other uh, business, this meeting is adjourned at 9.02 p.m.